So good morning, everyone. Um, I think this is uh, everyone has joined us already. Thank you all for coming this morning to this panel on uh, palliative care and uh, terminal illnesses. Our first presenter will be um, Brooke Kowalke, um, who is an assistant professor in the departments of English and Medical Humanities at Creighton University in Omaha. She teaches and researches memoirs and other life writing that deal with illness, de death, and grief. She is currently at work on a memoir titled Grace Notes, Lessons on Panhood, Personhood, um, and Love. Her paper today is entitled The Beautiful, Vibrant, Living World Goes On, Bearing Witness to One's Own Dying in that Nina, sorry, Nina Riggs' The Bright Hour. Um, are you happy to start, Brooke? All right, thank you so much, Adina. Um, so I, I am joining you all from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, it is wee hours here and we're having an electrical storm. So um, fingers crossed, we'll get through this paper and uh, um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you all this morning. <clears throat> um, all right, so we'll begin. Uh, to bear witness is to open a window on the unknown, writes Maria Armin. And this is what Nina Riggs does in her 2017 memoir, The Bright Hour, a memoir of living and dying, published just months after her own death. She invites us into her experience as, like the cancer that grows within her, the narrative progresses through stages, one, two, three, and four. Along the way, Riggs also bears witness to her mother's illness and eventual death what she calls some kind of morbid test drive for her own experience. Riggs writes each stage of her story in brief episodes in the present tense, so that as Nora Krug notes, it feels present. That sense of being present to her experience enables Riggs's act of writing to become an act of bearing witness. She creates a new way of being where the mundane is infused with meaning and where her labor of love in bearing witness to her own dying process allows her readers to accompany her into the unknown. By bearing witness to her own suffering, Riggs makes visible this underseen form of emotional labor and reclaims the agency sick women in literature often lose. In this paper, I want to consider the practice of bearing witness, particularly as it occurs in a clinical setting, and then use that lens to uncover the ways Nina Riggs does this important work in her memoir, as well as how it allows her and her readers to move toward a greater sense of agency and wholeness in encounters with the uncertain or unknown. In her book, Narrative Medicine, Rita Sharon says that, quote, what we can learn already from oral history and trauma studies is that the work of bearing witness does not do violence to the speaker, does not interfere in the telling, but rather is committed to active, respectful, confirming listening. Those acts of telling and listening take place in what she elsewhere describes as a sort of trinity. She argues that the body and illness is alien from the self by virtue of disease. So then there is the body of the patient and there is the self of the patient. That body and that self talk with each other as in the role of the ghost hovering nearby and listening, the physician witnesses the encounter. Sharon also argues that through writing, body and self can be reconciled. She notes that, quote, as the body's hand holds the pen or hovers on the keyboard, it tells the self that which the self does not know. Even before the presence of the reader makes itself felt, the text itself occupies that third ghostly position, delivering the mediating witness of words and enabling the body to present the words to the self who, in a manner of speaking, wrote them. In this triangulation, the teller is, quote, both source and destination of the account with the ghostly listener or text or reader mediating the transfer. This telling to the self witnessed by the ghostly listener creates an opportunity for the teller to regain agency that has been lost. That agency for Riggs looks a lot like hope, a hope for the future that exists in the absence of certainty without attachment to a particular outcome and in which she is likely dead. Tamson Jones argues that bearing witness and hope are inextricably linked. If disease and suffering alienate the self from the body, then perhaps their reconciliation through a process that embodies hope also allows the self to become an agent once again. Jones explains that, quote, while it remains unfinished, the act of bearing witness at its best speaks of a kind of receptivity and response that relinquishes the need for specific evidence, demonstrates an openness to truth, even if that is a truth that confounds and scandalizes. This act is a concrete depiction of hope. 
This hope provides a way forward in wholeness, even if that wholeness exists in a context of the uncertain and the unknown, even if that wholeness ceases to be alive on earth and takes up residence in or as a text. We can trace out the work of bearing witness and the effect it has on Nina through the four stages of her memoir. In chapter one of stage one of the book, Nina gets her cancer diagnosis. Quote, cancer in the breast, the doctor from the biopsy says, one small spot, one small spot. I repeat it to John, her husband. I repeat it to my dad. I repeat it to my best friend, Tita, and she repeats it to me. I repeat it brushing my teeth in the carpool line clapping, falling asleep, walking the aisles of the grocery store, walking on the greenway, lying in the cramped, clanky cave of the MRI machine while they take a closer look. One small spot. It becomes a chant, a rallying cry. One small spot is fixable. There's a concreteness, a sense of control, a sense of the danger being contained in this description of the cancer that has been discovered in Nina's breast. No one, Nina says, dies from one small spot. Nina's body and self here struggle to remain united. She continues to exert control over her body, refusing to believe that the disease within might make her body alien to herself. And we as readers witness the start of something that seems simple, but soon grows beyond anyone's control. And even as she attempts to hang on to control, we see Riggs begin to prepare herself for something different. A descendant of Ralph Waldo Emerson, she rereads his essays. She continues to chant one small spot, and she also thinks of what Emerson wrote in her favorite of his essays titled Circles. Quote, the universe is fluid and volatile. Permanence is but a word of degrees. I try, Nina says, to hold both of these ideas like two little magnets in my hand, his and mine. One small spot, and the universe is fluid and volatile. They push against each other. One small spot requires the constant energy to keep things contained. The universe is fluid and volatile is scary, but allows for the idea that there are things that cannot be contained. These two thoughts flip around and now cannot be pulled apart. As Riggs sees herself, sees her way of thinking and challenges that way of thinking, we see her working to attend to the details of her experience and to make sense of them. At the same time, we see her laying the groundwork for the idea that she may never make sense of her experience and that she may have to find a different way to move forward. As Riggs approaches the date of her mastectomy, she reflects on her body that is no longer her own. It has been, she says, requisitioned by illness, medicine. When her young son asks her where her breast will go once it has been removed, she jokingly replies, quote, probably a drawer in a basement lab somewhere at Duke. Well, they keep the tumor for future testing, but I guess they maybe throw out the breasts. Not my breasts, but the breasts. We see Nina's body and self becoming alien to one another, reconciled only because of her telling the story, first on the page, and as a result, back to herself and then to the reader. After her surgery, Riggs carefully examines her surgical site, noting the size and shape of her scar, the new terrain of her chest with only a memory occupying the space where her breast once was. As she writes what she calls surveyor's notes about her new physical shape, Riggs remembers Montaigne's assertion that, quote, I study myself more than any other subject. That is my metaphysics, that is my physics. Reflecting on Montaigne's search for truth through self-examination and self-knowledge, Riggs articulates her own new relationship to herself and her experience. Her approach will be, quote, relentless searching while at the same time unattached to the outcome of whatever is discovered. In other words, she determines to bear witness to her own experience. As Tamsin Jones again reminds us, quote, to bear witness to an event is not to give an explanation of it, nor does it presuppose a correlational theory of knowledge where subjective expectations are adequately matched by the objective evidence given. From here, we see Riggs embody the kind of hope that Jones describes, a hope that is neither passive nor idolatrous. Instead, it is a hope that is activating, a hope that enables Riggs to reclaim and recreate herself and her world in a way that is meaningful to her in the face of the unknown and uncontrollable. Riggs puts this approach into action about halfway through the book when just after her mother has died, Nina instructs herself to, quote, walk into that house where her dead body waits, 
Watch your father weep, enter the scene, imagine it as your own. In this moment, we see Riggs preparing to bear witness to her mother's dead body and to her father's grief. And we also see her preparing for her own death along the way. Riggs walks through the door and observes her surroundings, her family and herself carefully, ultimately spending a few days together with her family and her mother's body, quote, watching her change and become increasingly less her. We see a woman whose orientation to her life has changed. No longer the woman holding on so tightly to the one small spot mantra, a mantra that has been destroyed by the spread of her cancer. She bears witness to her mother's death and also to her own process of learning to confront death and grief. Later, when a doctor suggests to Nina that she make a bucket list after it has become clear that her cancer has metastasized and is aggressive, she is stumped. Instead of creating a list of extravagant adventures, Riggs says, quote, I want all of it all the things to do with living, and I want them to keep feeling messy and confusing and even sometimes boring. What she wants is the mundane, the sense that each day she'll wake up and do it all over again. And in carefully telling to herself and to us the small details of her days, the domestic, the medical, the lovely, and the unlovely, she makes the mundane miraculous. By bearing witness to these details, by recording them for us and allowing us to bear witness to them too, we watch Nina experience moments of transcendence, such as Emerson described in his journal. Quote, that is mourning, to cease for a bright hour to be a prisoner of this sickly body and to become as large as the world. For Riggs, becoming as large as the world means encompassing all of the daily details, immersing herself in the minutia of the ones she loves. For a while, Riggs's focus lands on finding a new couch for the family. She knows her cancer has metastasized and she knows it probably won't ever go away. Confined mostly to her bed and staving off pain with heavy hitting medication, Riggs writes that, quote, these days finding the perfect living room couch has begun to feel like the most important thing I've ever done. Yet each time she finds a good candidate, she can't hit the order button. Reflecting on her uncharacteristic hesitation, she realizes she's trapped in a cost benefits analysis. She wonders how much it makes sense to spend on something she may not use for long herself, but she also sees, quote, buying an expensive couch as a kind of lovely expression of hopefulness. The couch becomes a symbol for the kind of legacy she will leave, stylish comfort for future guests or a hideous and uncomfortable couch that the imagined new wife won't be able to get rid of, quote, because the dead wife bought it. The couch becomes much more than a simple purchase. For a moment, it becomes that ghostly listener of Sharon's trinity of witnessing. Riggs's body searching for comfort in the midst of her pain. Riggs's self imagining versions of the future in which she is dead. And the couch reconciles the two as it becomes, quote, something that will hold us through everything that lies ahead, the loving, collapsing, and nuzzling the dying, the grieving. The couch project also helps Riggs confront that which she cannot figure out, quote, how to let go of mothering her two young sons. In fact, she says the couch allows her to let go of figuring it out. Maybe she says she'll, quote, just aim to get the couch right. Strong bones, high quality leathers, something earthy and animal and real, a surface that knows something of what it was to be alive, that warms to our touch and cools in our absence. The couch search and bearing witness to it through writing allows Riggs to regain agency, to make decisions about her life and about her future that have in many ways been taken from her during the course of her diagnosis and treatment. She cannot cure her cancer. She cannot solve the problem of letting go of mothering her sons, but she can find a couch. She can ground herself in a mundane domestic project that is imbued with the weight of all the things she cannot solve. And in writing about it, she allows us to be that ghostly listener too receiving her telling and considering our response to it. Finally, Riggs closes the book with a reminder to herself and to her readers of a conversation she and her husband John had soon after her diagnosis. Quote, my voice, I have to love these days the same as any other. His voice, I'm so afraid I can't breathe. And then she reflects, quote, we're making our way like this though. We are breathless, but we love the days. They are promises. They are the only way to walk from one night to the other. In an act of generous mothering, she models that way of being for her young sons. 
showing them how to make their way from one night to the other, loving all of the moments in between, whatever they hold. She closes the book enigmatically, describing a backyard scene on the evening of her oldest son's 10th birthday. Quote, already the boys are off to the wilds again, whooping and surviving. It will be getting dark soon. The sky has started with that eerie post-apocalyptic light of a warm evening in winter, but I am not ready to call them back in. There is nothing in this whole world that could make me call them back in. In the course of her narrative, in the process of bearing witness to her own suffering and to the present and future suffering of those around her, Riggs fashions a way of being that is true to herself and encourages her beloveds to do the same, to stay out in the wilds, to whoop and survive for as long as possible. As readers, we bear witness to Riggs' own process of bearing witness. We, as ghostly listeners, see the work she does to arrive at this final moment, a moment when she has discovered how to begin letting go after all. We receive her telling, and as the ghostly listener, we participate in what Sharon calls, quote, the active transport of love. Sharon says, quote, once we experience our capacity to witness the plight of another through loving commitment, we have at our disposal this permeability to others' suffering, this receptivity toward the words of others, this generosity of self in the service of another self trying to be heard. By reading Riggs' memoir this way, we recognize how Riggs makes visible the work of bearing witness to her dying. Riggs uses the practice of bearing witness to reconcile her body to herself, to tell herself that which she already knows. And as a result, she regains the agency her cancer diagnosis threatens. At the same time, reading her work this way immerses her readers in the process of bearing witness and allows us to experience its transformative power as well. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke, for this wonderful paper. Um, I look forward to discussing, with it, discussing it with you further. We will be taking uh, questions um, at the end after we listen to all the other papers. So uh, Diana Andrea Novochano uh, is a contributing writer for the US-based Synapsis, a health humanities journal, as well as an independent curator. She has been involved in a number of projects engaging uh, in practice-based and practice-led research and has published a chapter in the critical catalog, Ion Grigorescu, The Painted Work, um, as well as part of the project team currently curating the exhibit at the National Museum of Art of Romania. Uh, Diana's paper today is entitled Looking Eastward, Post-Soviet or Women Illness Discourses in Contemporary Art. And now it's over to you, Diana. Thank you very much. So um, as some of you know, I have had some technical issues. So I, I will briefly represent two case studies of um, an ongoing research project. Uh, and then you can um, further ask me questions. And uh, I think we will cover some of the multitude of facets of this subject. So the cases I will present is those of uh, artist, our daughter artist uh, Alina Popa, who unfortunately died in 2019, and uh, um, of Polish artist Katarzyna Kozia. Um, uh, Katarzyna Kozia um, studied in Warsaw uh, and then in Germany. She um, is an artist who uh, has done everything from sculpture to performance. She engaged in a lot of video and multimedia practices. In uh, the 90s, she was diagnosed with a form of leukemia. Um, and uh, uh, whilst undertaking treatment, she created this piece based on Manas Olympia. Um, uh, this is uh, Olympia, the blue version. It's one of the three uh, Olympia reenactions she did. Uh, it is a self-portrait of the artist and uh, the cat you see, uh, it's actually a stuffed cat and it's part of a previous installation that uh, she did, which caused um, quite a number of concerns regarding contemporary art practice in Poland. Uh, this is Olympia in white in which she is no longer recreating uh, the painting's uh, initial setting. And she is um, in a wide sterile cl um, clinical, sp clinical space. And uh, she also obtained the uh, consent from another patient and she created this further piece of Olympia, in which Olympia is um, an old woman uh, in direct contrast to the young courtesan depicted, depicted in the 19th century painting. 
Um, in her own words, Kozia describes, I allowed to photograph myself naked on a drip to prove that sick body has just as much dignity and is just as normal as the healthy one. When you look nice, you don't think about how you function. Looking at a sick body, you are thinking about its mortality. All the healthy people are okay because they don't wear the physicality on the outside and they don't walk around as the, and they walk around as their perfect selves. Uh, now, um, another thing uh, that Kozia did was um, she created a casting process for um, um, another film called Project X, in which she casted women as herself. Um, and some of the women who came, they had their own cancer narratives. Some of them were artists. Some of them had no um, training with the arts. But um, it was a really interesting experiment in how the embodiment and the, and the feminized version, version uh, of illness, and especially of cancer, um, how um, it can be transmitted to the public and how it can be worked through as a color uh, collaborative project, process. Um, uh, what is also very important about Kozia's work is that contrasted to um, other examples of photographic self-portrait series, such as those of those pants uh, or of uh, Hannah Wilke, she um, initially wanted to depict another patient who became a friend, a, a, a word colleague named Magda, but unfortunately Magda had uh, uh, passed away before the project could be started. So uh, it was at the beginning a sort of unwilling self-portrait from which the artist grew and she also gained strength from it. Um, and um, another very interesting thing about it, um, which showcases the importance of using textual evidence alongside with the actual uh, visual artistic project, is that at the moment of its creation of its, uh, the Olympia's creative conception and creation, she was in a relationship with the oncologist treating her, and she uh, describes the experience, uh, this um, very troubled and your relation had. He did everything to cure me so that I would be alive and healthy. He's on his side with all his apparatus of medical knowledge and I'm on the other side with my body and disease. My willingness to completely surrender to him on all levels seem obvious because he was a body guy at the level of cells metabolism. That is the basis of biological being. But there is also the body as bodily subjectivity, mine alone. Uh, the relationship did not last long after she um, went into remission. Um, and um, some of the major problems came from the actual creation and showcasing of the piece of Olympia. Uh, he was surprised by me saying, I'm making fun of disease. What fucking fun? I wasn't making fun. It probably had something to do with the scandal at the hospital. It blew up harder than I realized at the time. After my Olympia exhibition was shown on TV, Sister Zosia, the nurse in the picture, the one who gave me the IV, was really upset by the fact that she was suddenly on TV in a photo and in a video together with me. I don't understand why she was so upset about it. She didn't want to see me anymore after that. She shouted at me, get out of my sight. I really didn't understand. After all, she had always given me the IV, only now I was naked. I don't know what happened there, but I felt cheated by them, misunderstood. It's just ended and that's it. We're still friends, the doc and I. Sister Zosia, with whom I even thought myself to be friends, because these therapies had been ongoing for so long, felt misappropriated. Or maybe she sensed deviations, maybe it interfered with her humility. But I'm appropriating by doing the work, I'm appropriating other people. Um, and as John Berger knows, uh, that almost all post Renaissance European sexual imagery is frontal, either literally or metaphorically, because the sexual protagonist is the spectator uh, owner looking at it. It is very um, important to know the way in which uh, Kozira transcends both the male and medical gaze through this appropriation of both the clinical space and the sexualized pictorial poses. Um, also, while comparing it to the original Olympia, um, we have to note um, a fact which is often offered seen by uh, art historians, which is the quite medicalized language um, which this painting provoked, especially at the Parisian Salon of um, 1865. 
so these are just some examples of criticism of Olympia. The expression of Olympia's face is that of a prematurely aged and vicious uh, prostitute. The body's purifying color recalls the horror of the morgue. Uh, it is said of her that her complexion was dead of yellow fever and already arrived at an advanced state of decomposition, that the crowd uh, was standing in front of the putrefied Olympia as if it were at the morgue. And um, one critic even compared her to a skeleton dressed in a tight fitting tunic of plaster. And this uh, examples, this example of a critical writing show us um, just how medicalized um, the female body was in the 19th century and how important it is to use this textual production alongside with the visual one in order to uh, achieve uh, a solid framework for analysis. Uh, I also want to point out that other artists have been using um, medical spaces and um, um, medical um, supplies, for example, um, in their artwork in Eastern and Central Europe, for example, Stano Jagodik, a Slovenian artist who has been working with X-rays montages since 1972. But what is very important to artists such as Jagodik who were usually uh, male and they were tolerated by the regime, is that even if uh, the art stands out in uh, the realm of social realism and state-approved art, uh, their attitudes towards the female uh, body and um, women in general uh, were very patriarchal usually. And we can note such an example in uh, two of Jagovic's uh, radiograph collages uh, in which we most of the women are in uh, erotic poses. They are vintage erotic photographs, whilst men are depicted usually closed and uh, usually doing um, important social work, being uh, involved in production, being involved in military service and so on. So we have this ju juxtaposition of the masculine and feminine in very patriarchal and very conventional roles, even for Soviet and socialist society. And finally, I will briefly go to Alina Popa, so uh, she was a Romanian artist. She was engaged in photography and choreography and performance. She was the co-founder of the Bucharest-based Bureau of Melodramatic Research, which investigated issues at the intersection of gender, capitalism, neoliberalism, and the post-Soviet landscape. And unfortunately, she was diagnosed with an incurable condition. And over the course of two years, she did several projects which uh, had both an artistic and a self-healing quality. Um, um, Disease as an Aesthetic Project is her last text, and it uh, was amassed by her friends based on uh, notes that she had written in the final uh, weeks of her life. Um, and uh, in each, uh, and it, it really links to a project of hers, her last project called The Clinic, where together with some artist friends, they went to a Transylvanian village and they tried to develop therapies that could also function as artworks. And this was established on the idea of art worlds, that is a choreographed process through which artwork was not just production, but it evolved into a, a, a healing performative practice, uh, which stood at the intersection of art and medicine. And here is how Popa describes her experience in this use of an aesthetic project. When something intimately changes your body, your possibilities to move, your dynamic with the outer world, your identity for many people, your limits to what you can hear, that thing forces you into inner transformation. I hate the thing. I love the thing. The thing forces me over my edges. I cannot squeeze it out of me. I cannot directly influence it. I can only take it as a challenge to my rational mind to have what I have been to my own limitations. She uh, describes the way in which um, uh, the bodily modifications in her lag uh, is affecting her whole worldview, how she becomes centered on the whole uh, in her lag, on the wound to even a cellular level. Uh, and um, finally, she describes her experiences with palliative care, where she is basically told she has to go home and that this is the end. And she feels that this is a script that the doctors, they made the script, imposed it on people like me. We have proof. We know better. Reality follows the script if it is believed 
and they spent centuries to impose it on us. My reality just performed a triangle joke on theirs. I am home at Sana's, on the bed, red chicks and all, playing with my cats. I am alive. Um, and um, from here on, she goes into an exploration of symptoms and of illness as a poem with the language of symptoms. And it is through uh, this sort of uh, creative dismantling um, uh, that a state of self-healing might be rich. She um, uh, opposes this against conventional Western medicine, declaring that I hate that doctors nullify my poem with their order work. Healing is an alchemical process, moving, reinterpreting, re-symbolizing. The body is abstract. It occupies more space than where it finds itself. And there are, of course, a lot more perspectives of Eastern European artists. Uh, there is also um, a very important uh, direction that the female performance uh, artists from the 60s and 70s used in their work, like for example, Jetta Brotesco, a famous Romanian artist, she declared one time that what the doctor does in medicine, I did in art. And this is a common metaphor for a lot of uh, women artists who work during Soviet times uh, in which their art took a self-healing role and a social healing role. So thank you very much. This is another collage of Jagovic. And if you have any questions, I look forward to them. <laughs> I will stop screen sharing now. Thank you very much for this brilliant paper, Diana. I see that Jana hasn't been able um, to join us. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions. Um, if you have any, um, it's a, a small group, so we have a lot of time for discussion. So I already see a common uh, question for me. Uh, thank you very much. So, yes, some of them have been published in English. I will leave my email address in the chat and I uh, will try and send you all the materials I have in English soon. For example, uh, Jetta Bratescu and uh, Kaldiash, uh, they uh, exhibited at the Venice Biennale and of course they have had a lot of uh, material on their works translated. Uh, Alina Popa wrote in English quite a lot. Um, uh, some of the lesser known uh, artists, not really, unfortunately, and there's also the problematic of where, where the textual archives are hosted because uh, their um, works of art may be in, let's say, um, state museums, uh, but their private archives may be um, owned by their families or maybe owned by another foundation. And it's actually, um, it is pretty complicated sometimes to get to join the visual and the textual to provide a full analysis. Any more questions from the floor, the virtual floor? Um, I uh, have a question for you, Diana, first, um, nice. mostly because of the, we have the, the same uh, um, social background. Um, so I was wondering about uh, Jetta Bertesco's comments about what I did in, uh, in medicine, other people, um, what I did in, mm -hmm. what in medicine I did in, in my art. Um, and I was wondering whether you could see that also as a comment for her to uh, carve out a space in a, in a world where artists aren't particularly valued um, and to, to show that she's as important um, as a doctor and to kind of improve her social standing. Oh, yes, of course, I, I truly believe that. Uh, but I also think that in Brotesco's case, like outside her youth, where she couldn't get to college in the 50s because of all the Stalinist rules concerning her family background, afterwards, she lived a, a, quite a shorter life for communist time. So I think that is especially true in the cases of artists who are a lot more marginalized, who couldn't find works and who rebelled through this sort of medical appropriation. Um, in Brotesco's case, I think that is true as in carving a place for herself in society. Society, uh, but I think it's more potent in the case of other uh, women artists. Thank you so much. Um, I also have um, a question for uh, Brooke. Um, if you'd like to um, uh, unmute. Um, so I was really uh, struck by by the fact that um, in uh, Riggs's case, uh, writing provides both a form of reconciliation, but also um, of 
alienation. So she's both bringing the body together with the body and, and the self together um, in the face of, of illness, um, as well as this, um, the writing is allowing her to distance herself from the body. Um, and I was really struck by those comments about uh, my breast and the breast um, and how she manages to distance herself uh, from it. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm kind of still sorting through on some level how she's working with all of that um, and how she's uh, kind of, I think one of the things I appreciate about her is the way that she makes that edge visible, you know, that she's not afraid to kind of, um, in some ways, like be inconsistent, you know, um, to to be kind of trying to draw near and at the same time, I, you know, she doesn't even, she doesn't really even analyze her own kind of distancing in that moment, but she in other instances will go um, and be waiting after a scan and she can read her own scans. And so she can see herself as that medicalized body and she can also see herself as this mother and wife and friend. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that's just so powerful about the, the book is the way that she allows all of that to be on the page together um, and kind of, uh, resists um, a tidy narrative, you know? And I think that's why I like that last line so much that she talks about, um, I teach this often to, to med students. I teach this text because they want everything to kind of wrap up neatly. And she really resists that with her refusal to call her boys in um, from their whooping and surviving. And it's a really odd phrase. Like it's not like a colloquial, you know, we don't whooping and surviving. Um, and so I feel like that's kind of that distance and that reconciliation is that whooping and surviving for her, you know, that, that this is how she can kind of be in the world um, and embrace all of those pieces of herself without having to make it all come together. Um, so I'm kind of still sorting that through, but I, I'm with you. I appreciate that about her. Um, and I appreciate too that she wrote the book um, knowing that she probably would not survive to see its publication. Um, and so there's something very intentional, I think, about confronting that reality um, in this narrative, um, unlike one that, you know, is written in the hope of surviving, I suppose, you know, so I think it takes a different tenor in that in that regard, too. Anyway, it kind of went a lot of different places, but. <laughs> and I was really, I really like that. Uh... Uh, line that you mentioned that one small spot in the universe is fluid and, and volatile and it was really interesting because in um, uh, discussions of, of grief whether of self-grief or of grieving for others um, as well as um, in discussions of uh, illness um, it's usually time that that gets mentioned a lot not space and matter mm -hmm. and this is very striking yeah, that's a great, that's a great, thank you. <laughs> that's a great observation. Um, and also, um, it's really great to be um, doing these online conferences because I have all my library home. I don't know if you know this story by Laurie Moore. Um, it's called Go Like This um, mm -hmm. in self-help. And, um, and it's uh, about a, a woman who is experiencing, um, she has a cancer diagnosis. Um, and um, how the people around her react and, and her husband who's also having a, an, an affair and how she's dealing with leaving um, everything behind. And she also um, has a line in the beginning where she says that she writes as a woman who knows which pieces of furniture look right together in the living room. Um, and then she talks about her cancer diagnosis. So that would be working greatly with the, the couch. The couch. <laughs> <laughs> the witnessing yeah wonderful thank you i will i will find it, and read it i'm sure you can find it um she's an amazing writer anyway so it's worth a, a read do we Absolutely. have any any questions or would um anyone like to tie the papers together um they're very we're very different in their approach from the visual side and the and the literary side well, I think that in a way, uh, what we did in this panel is that we tied together so many minority perspectives of people, uh, women who had not been listened to 
And we have this common thread going in Soviet and post-Soviet spaces in Eastern Europe. We have it in the United States. We have it in other places. We have been on a journey today with the presentations. And it just shows how much women voices have grown in the past 50 years and just how much they will probably grow from now on. It's uh, agreed. I, I think that women's voices are really amplified. I, I don't necessarily think that we've always made great strides in, uh, in people's hearing getting a little better, especially in the, in the medical profession. Um, I think people, um, even you know, women, men as well, are treated somehow as independent of their illness. It's the, mm -hmm. the illness that gets treated and not the, the patient. And um, it's been, it's really slow to change. So Brooke, how do you, do you feel about this, about this kind of, you, you were talking about how things, your medical students, how things like, they like things to come together. Mm -hmm. um, how do they like things to come together? Because when it comes to the doctor patient relationship, they don't really like things to come together too much. Yeah, I guess in terms of solvability, right? Like I was really struck, um, Diana, and your, I, I'm gonna get the, the artist's name incorrect, I'm sure, but Koz, Koz. Koz, yeah, yes. It's okay, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> um, uh, with the her contrast, I think you had a quote there about how she wanted people to, um, be confronted with the healthy body and the sick body and how yes. we want to think about those things is so distinct, but in fact, you know, kind of forcing us to reconsider. Um, and I feel like that's part of what I feel like Riggs does for the mm -hmm. medical students is that um, instead of just becoming the disease and the scans, um, they have to confront that there's this yeah. whole, whole world outside mm -hmm. of the clinic for her. Um, that affects the decision she makes in the clinic. So her treatment plan is affected by that whole life. And we as living human beings and they as living human beings know that kind of on a um, kind of just lived experience level. But when they enter that clinical space, that whole um, other realm, that, that healthy body that's existing or that person that's existing outside the clinic kind of disappears for them and they get so focused on the disease and the clinical and what they can fix. Um, and in her narrative, she includes a lot of scenes with her physicians, um, some positive and some less positive, but one that we talk about a lot is one where a nurse offers some um, deep breathing techniques uh, to help her kind of center herself in the face of her metastatic cancer diagnosis. And her oncologist is there too. And she says um, in a kind of moment of unusual humility that uh, the nurse has something greater to offer to Nina than she does at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, that's a spot where the medical students have to step back and think, okay, there are going to be limits to what we can do. There's mm -hmm. limits to what we can um, achieve. And, and they have to reconsider what that means for their patient and what that means for them. And I think, um, I think however, for me, that, that, that healthy body, sick body really resonated. And I, I'm going to look those things up and especially that interview in Bomb Magazine um, and bring that into the classroom. Uh, so thank you, because I think those, those are really powerful images to, to force students to kind of think about uh, that that same idea in some new some new ways. So <clears throat> it's very interesting what what you were saying about the the medical students and um, the the doctor relationship and the fact that the nurse has more to offer. I wonder how they react to the fact that um, hierarchies aren't as fixed as they think. Yes. Um, and I'm thinking of how that uh, nurse that Katya interacted with uh, got so upset by her presence in the artworks she was so used to dealing with patients with such strong emotions usually and taking care of them. So um, through basically the whole of their lives if the cases were difficult. Uh, but uh, in the moment she became part of the artwork, her role changed, her perspective changed, and she uh, just became adverse to the process she had taken part in. Yeah, it was really interesting. 
It's interesting. Did she not know that she was being photographed? Was that like I? I, I think so. From what this. I've read, from what I've read, um, um, the artist's diagnosis was quite serious. I don't think. I think she was. Uh, uh, just uh, helping her get through a project she didn't think was going to be finished. But interesting. And I think that uh, honestly, for a lot of uh, this sort of work of visual artists who get permission to work in clinical spaces, I think that a lot of times the doctors don't think that it will actually get done. And when it does get finished, you have to uh, you start having all these ethical issues. But why did you let them film, photograph here, and so on? This shouldn't have happened. And uh, um, the relation between doctors and patients suddenly cool off. And, so on. Yeah. And there's another case in the UK of uh, an artist, John Bellani, uh, and uh, he was operated by a leading transfer sur surgeon, Roy Kalna, who um, was also a painter in his uh, own. And uh, um, afterwards, Bellani started doing self portrait in the um, um, basically recovery world after the transplant. He did a few dozen works and uh, he became a very good friend with the surgeon. He gave him like an intensive uh, painting class, an intensive painting workshop. Karl totally changed his style and now he's a, a lot more known as an artist. But at the same time, afterwards, after a few weeks, after he he was released from the hospital, uh, the relation cooled off and then they stopped speaking. So you have this sort of bond which is created by necessity, uh, by this uh, um, a bit of a forced being together because the, the patient needed a doctor. Uh, but after the transplant, after uh, the moment he is well on his feet, and then the relations cooled off. It was not something natural. It was something that was bonded through illness and through a traumatic experience. So uh, yes, if you have any more, any questions or if you want any links to images uh, I have spoken about, just email me. I have left my email there or you can follow me on Twitter and I would be more than glad to help you find them. Wonderful. I, I really, uh appreciated your work um that you also presented in, in the seminar because it's, it's really oh, great thank you no it's it's really great and in, in, in this online space to be able mm -hmm. to talk about more than just the western perspectives and um we know that also in the east um it's hard to get access to a lot of of uh, materials uh when it comes to working on on certain artists they're not very well preserved um oh, yeah. <laughs> people don't have much interest especially if they're women um so um it's, it's really good that you're really bringing this to the fore I'm, I'm really glad i i was able to um see some names that i didn't I hadn't seen and um honestly i heard the first time i heard about jetta Botesco was uh in london because she's represented by a mm -hmm. so yeah um absolutely no knowledge here um I only know all the artists I know are are men. So, um. yeah. Well, um, I uh, am uh, working on a project with a friend, a sort of medical related project on Eastern European experiences. So, uh, if you uh, we want, and if you know any writers who are Eastern European or who have roots from this area, then maybe we can speak some more some other time because I would love to have also a literary and not only visual side of this experience. Yeah, I will um, keep that in mind. Um, I'm not super up to date with uh, Romanian literature anymore, unfortunately. Um, no worries. Yeah, it's just chaotic. I have a friend at the publishing house and, uh, but, you know, there are we still publish quite a lot compared to other countries, but mm. it's just a game of numbers right now. So uh, it's like, do you think this book would attract enough uh, readers or not? Oh, it's Swiss cancer is depressing. Why don't you self-publish? Like, they're very blunt on stuff like this. It would attract a lot more readers if the prices were half what they are. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a Eastern European problem. The books, access to books is becoming more and more difficult. I mean, they cost the same. <laughs> A British published a UK published book it's ridiculous yeah so um apparently Jana has major issues she's rebooting rebooting her computer because it throws on her it doesn't seem to be working 
I will have to chair a panel in 30 minutes, so I don't think I, I will be able to stay here much longer, so I can take a short break. Um, Brooke, is there anything you'd like to add? I'm really happy that um, we managed to, to do this uh, so well, even in, in the face of adversity. Um, no, it was wonderful I, to meet everybody. And to your children you. behaved and your dog. They did. Um, they let you all uh, go um, sleep tight, Brooke. Um, <laughs> we hours of the morning there, and uh, yeah. good luck fighting the heat, the Diana. It's pretty. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. under the heat dome right now. Mm. Yeah, uh, good luck uh, with chairing the panel. I have to produce one, so thank you for coming, and I hope uh, we'll get to keep in touch. It was really a fabulous panel. Of course, have a lovely day or night Thanks, wherever everybody. you are. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, let's get started. So welcome to this panel on narratives of disability. My name is uh, Veronika Schuchter. I'll be chairing the session today. Um, I'm a white European woman with shoulder length, blonde hair and a dark top. And today we have four speakers with us who will be presenting three brilliant sounding papers. I will introduce each panelist in turn and they will speak for about 15 minutes and then we will have a longer Q&A session at the end. The chat is open, so please feel free to deposit any questions there when they come to mind, um, but also, you'll, you'll also be very welcome to use the raise hand feature if you want to ask your questions directly at the end. Okay, so first up we have Gabrielle Hanley Mott who will be speaking about acquiring disability and incomplete ideological change after amputation and in Ursula K. Le Guin's The Day Before the Revolution. And um, Gabrielle is currently a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology at SUNY Binghamton in the United States. Gabby, if you want to share your screen, um, the floor is all yours, and we're looking forward to hearing your paper. Uh, so good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you especially to uh, Veronica and Claire. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I also apologize for my extremely long and overly specific title, which I have shortened here. Uh, and I am a white woman, brunette, uh, in a red and yellow blouse. Uh, all right. So to begin, uh, the first premise of this paper is that in Western society, ableism is built into our contemporary politics and daily life. Ableism is an embodied political subjectivity that is, for example, practiced in both our physical built environments and in media representations. However, for able-bodied people living in a world designed by and for them, ableism is often invisible to them. The second premise is that bodies carry politics. We embody the politics of the societies we live in. Many scholars have observed this, each emphasizing something different in their theory, such as Bourdieu with habitus, affect theory, or phenomenology. Uh, I find Margaret Price's 1987 article useful. She links body-mind together in one word to emphasize, quote, how processes within our being impact one another in such a way that the notion of a physical versus mental process is difficult, if not impossible to clearly discern in most cases. This idea links one's intellectual and emotional practices and beliefs to one's body. The third premise of this paper is that being born with a disability is different from acquiring a disability that these are different understandings and experiences of what it means to have a disability. And these different understandings are related to the first two premises. For example, this means that someone with an acquired disability can carry invisible and embodied ableism, that these political and mental practices are linked to their now disabled bodies. This means that ableism as a political habitus can be internalized and affect one's relationship with one's body. And this affects able-bodied, people born with disabilities, and people who acquire disabilities differently. <clears throat> so, sorry. Uh, my discipline is medical anthropology, medical cultural, cultural anthropology. 
and my fieldwork was with upper extremity amputees, meaning amputations of the hand, arm, or shoulder. Amputation is an acquired disability rather than a difference that one is born with. Many of my interviewees struggle with prosthetic, uh, with, sorry, with post-amputation life, accepting the changes in their body, phantom sensations, and learning to use a prosthetic. They struggle to accept the additional time and effort that they have to put into caring for their body and the time and effort it takes to perform tasks. They and their loved ones struggle with the new presence of crib time in their lives. This has led me to the question that I'm currently working through, which is what does it mean for people to acquire a disability? What does it mean for people to live 25, 40, 55 years as able-bodied and then to find themselves visibly marked as disabled by an amputation? How does that interact with the often invisible and internalized ableism of our current culture? And in what ways does ableism reside in their body minds and affect their experience as an amputee? <clears throat> as I was struggling with this question one night, I picked up Ursula Le Guin's 1974 short story, The Day Before the Revolution. Now, if you've read The Dispossessed, this short story takes place 150 years before that book. Uh, it follows Lila, the leader of an anarchist revolution. In the story, she is elderly and dealing with the effects of a recent stroke. Uh, two things struck me about this story. First, it is an investigation of the way that politics is a physically lived experience in body minds. And second, the story reflects on the acquisition of politics as it applies to body minds. Uh, what this story foregrounds is that despite a successful revolution and living in an anarchist compound for years, Lila's body does not fully inhabit anarchist bodily modes, as when she discusses the youth living in the compound. The young people went about the halls of the house in becoming immodesty, but she was too old for that. She didn't want to spoil some young man's breakfast with the sight of her. Besides, they had grown up in the principle of freedom of dress and sex and all the rest, and she hadn't. All she had done was invent it. It's not the same. This connection between political and bodily modes is made further explicit when she reflects on her own bodily anxieties. A proper body is not an object, not an implement, not a belonging to be admired. It's just you yourself. Only when it's no longer you, but yours, a thing owned, do you worry about it. Is it in good shape? Will it do? Will it last? Here, Le Guin is pointing to the difference between when a body is a subject and when it is an object, alienated from the self. This alienation of the self from the body is a major theme in both disability studies and in anarchist theory. In disability studies, the focus is on the objectification of a body with disabilities by ableist and capitalist understandings of the body. This objectification is done through medicalization of disabled bodies, such as the insistence of curing disabilities, or more violently, by denying disabled lives as having quality of life. It can be seen through media, such as supercurp representations that infantilize disabled bodies, or alternatively, demand superhuman abilities and actions. Either way, supercurp representations make a disabled body into a symbol, an object and deny the subjecthood of the person in question. This shift from subject to object is important because one of the things that is discussed amongst prosthetists about amputees is whether or not a patient accepts their disability, accepts their prosthetic. To, yeah. to draw this more clearly, amputees after living able-bodied lives in which they internalize ableism and ableism which objectifies disabled bodies are then expected to, as quickly as possible, understand their newly disabled bodies as subjects and accept their current bodily conditions. The task that is set before amputees is to negotiate years of unexamined ableism, years of taken for granted able-bodied functioning, and to accept this change and make a subject out of a body that their embodied politics has taught them to objectify in nearly every way. Thus, what does it mean to acquire and accept a disability? Uh, to brief three, to briefly illustrate this, a quote from my research says, after 50 years of having an arm and then all of a sudden it's not there, 
your mind can't register that still. What links Ursula Le Guin's story to my fieldwork is the incomplete acquisition of new and altered body minds. Lila, in the day before the revolution, was unable to fully acquire an anarchist body mind. My interviewees are unable to acquire a native disability body mind and are caught in the ableism that they bring to their amputee experience. So in conclusion, the day after the revolution, sorry, the day after the revolution highlights the difficulty of changing one's embodied politics and opens a discussion on the relationship between bodily practice and political subjectivity. I believe this frame allows us to consider how the political changes of an individual may be incomplete and how this interacts with disabling and debilitating conditions. How can understanding this help us to better understand the individuals that we study in medical humanities? What other places, topics, or conditions in the medical humanities might it be useful to investigate the incomplete acquisition of new bodily modes? How do we read a body of a patient or in literature that has experienced multiple processes of acquisition? And since holding onto a single body mind practice is a privilege that is not available to all bodies, how can reading multiple inventions of a body mind as a way to survive certain political, cultural, social, and need medical realities change what we see or discuss. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gabby. This was amazing. I have, I have lots and lots of questions, but we'll keep them, we'll keep them um, to the end. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, we'll move on to our next paper and our next two speakers, but I think at the moment we still only have one speaker present. Is that correct? Yes, I'll be continuing with the presentation. Okay, that's um, great. Okay, then I'm just going to um, introduce you very quickly. Okay, here are my notes. So, Deba Shrita Day is an Institute Fellow and PhD and Teaching Assistant in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. She's currently working on literary gerontology for her doctoral thesis and her areas of research interest comprise feminist studies, disability studies and medical humanities. And in case our second speaker, um, we'll still be able to make it. I'm just going to introduce um, her as well. Um, the other co-author of this paper is Brianka Tribati, and she's an associate professor of English in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, also at the Indian Institute of Technology in Patna. She has published extensively in Indian literature, in English, a journal of the English Association, Journal of Graphic Novels and Comics, Postcolonial Studies, Economic and Political Weekly, amongst others. And she's also the book reviews editor of Rupatka Journal on Interdisciplinary interdisciplinary studies in humanities and she works in the area of Indian writing in English, place in literature, graphic novels and gender and sexuality studies. And the title of the paper today is Desire and Delirium, Contextualizing the Disabled Women in Select Indian Films. The floor is all yours, we're very much looking Thank forward you, to your paper. I'll just take a minute to share my screen. Wonderful. Hello everyone, I'm Devashrita and I will begin with the presentation. Now, cinematic narratives have often aligned the bodies it represents with an ideal norm of the human body, while other bodies are designated as abnormal, failing to achieve or even to aspire that norm. Now, unlike normative filmic bodies that literally advance the plot, the disabled body often exists primarily as a metaphor for the body that is unable to do so. Now, cinema in this particular context happens to be a visible counterpart to the less often visible social representations that mediate the way disability is conceived, perceived, and lived. Thus, the way disability has been harnessed by narratives, be it filmic, literary, or otherwise, often reaffirm the denigrating discourse of disability as lack from the perspective of a medical model or as a product of the ableist imaginary. The problem bodies 
as uh, has been uh, systematically uh, they have been differentiated from a socially and politically constructed able bodied or neurotypical norm now they stand for those bodily realities that within shifting ideologies represent the anomalies that contradict a normative understanding of a physical being it may also be significant to keep in mind that narratives of disability rarely incorporate sexuality preferring a sanitized image of platonic or amorous love instead hence the disabled bodies on the screen are constructed viewed appropriated and reappropriated from divergent perspectives and according to diverse interests that require understanding now the mentally disabled is one such problem body that has often been vilified in films with persistent stereotypes of psychosis as frightening shameful dangerous and incurable as a strong correlation exists between media content and audience beliefs there can be little doubt that cinematic representations of madness contribute towards reflecting and amplifying dominant cultural attitudes towards people with mental distress now understandably then the media's role in the stigmatization of mental illness has become a central concern as the historical process of othering divests these beings of their embodied subjectivity quite often mental illness and cinematic digesis have been brought into the narrative either as a peg for hanging the story or to provide some comic relief now the latter gives the audience the freedom to laugh at the mentally ill and feel relieved that this is not happening to them this is because the other seen on the screen may also become the other in their psyche thereby making it impossible for them to accept the psychotic individual because that would reflect a fear of losing control the french film theorist christian maist sees the viewer in this context as the voyeur and viewing the madness may also provide a sense of relief thank goodness it is not me thus a mentally ill character on the screen is simultaneously projected to have a sick body which separates the individual from the real individual and is the sick body the sickness being the individual now the portrayal of mental illness mental distress or disability and physical disability in indian films have broadly paralleled the cycle seen in hollywood cinema one however cannot negate the possibility that the essential core of psychiatric illness differs across cultures and that socio cultural aspects act as modifying factors influencing the presence of symptoms of the mentally ill the cultural meanings of illness are quite significant in that they partly define and influence perceptions and the monitoring of bodily processes as well as the very behaviors that constitute illness as a life experience now the bad on the screen presented by the other is not very dissimilar from the mad in this context because the bad gets resolved following appropriate punishment but for the mad it remains ambiguous and is influenced by several factors such as religious magical preoccupations and society's perceptions thus the portrayal of the mentally ill self is col colored by many factors the predominant one being the identification with the other self from being psychotic to be categorized as a psychopath hindi films film industry popularly known as bollywood has mostly typecast the unconventional bodies and minds in type in terms of monstrosity and invisibility such representations tend to moralize objectify pathologize and even marginalize the disabled body in the collective consciousness thereby restricting affirmative ways of recognizing the differently able now western feminist disability studies offer an important framework for understanding the lived experiences of bodies marked with both impairment and sex but the way subjectivity of a disabled female body works in structuring notions of femininity desirability and even sexuality can widely vary across cultures here it is important to discuss that the notion of ideal womanhood in the indian context was transferred to the political realms in the colonial period when nationalist movements against the british raj extensively used women as tropes for indigenous cultural purity 
women of flesh and blood had to sacrifice their desire and passion to become abstract symbols of a pure and ideal nation purged of the corrupting influence of the Occident. Women's physical confinement to the inner space of the household, popularly known as the Antar Mahal or the Zanana, is a manifestation of the spiritual inner core of, of Mother India. Now, following this political and cultural legacy, women in India are groomed to become good daughters, obedient wives, and sacrificing mothers who will not only question their defined roles, but also their spatial limits. Disab disability in this scenario does comes up as a malady, a terrible malady, because it interferes uh, with the image of a fertile and pure mother begating brave sons who can rever as well as protect her purity. Thus, disability in Indian religious and mythological contexts, and, some, and also it has been represented by some commercial movies, as a punishment of some grave sin committed in the past life. In case of women, the implication of the sin is serious here because it puts the religious, the political, as well as the social cultural par parameters of traditional Indian womanhood at risk. Thus, in this presentation, I would like to take up two films, Paramitar and Bin, House of Memories, and 15 Park Avenue from a gender disability perspective, as the director Aparna Sen carves a niche by nuancing the identity of the Indian woman through a pluralistic and also a polyvocal feminist lens. Since disabled or differently abled protagonists are valuable in understanding the concept of disability within the overarching framework of Indian reality. The audience in both the films are introduced to young women suffering from cognitive impairment and Sen explores their relationships as schizophrenic women with dreams of conjugal bliss. We get a glimpse of Kuku's desire for a normal married life in Paromita Ragbin on the day her brother gets married. When she earnestly asks her mother, when shall I become a bride? Dressed up as a bride, she yearns to lead the life of any abled girl of her age and her maternal instincts gets highlighted when she feeds her disabled young nephew and tells him stories. In 15 Park Avenue, the alternate world of Niti comes to life on the screen as we see her juggle a busy family, as well as her full-time job. Her imagined residential address, 15 Park Avenue, where her married life thrives, is the sole focus of her reality. These instances signify how despite their disability, their identities remain embedded within the internalized normative gendered structure, which invariably initiates them to perform the ascribed social roles of wifehood and motherhood in their own parallel reality. However, the subversive yearning by the rejected body is not only despised, but also feared by the society as they appear as a threat to the cultural ideals of an able body and its social roles. Thus, this makes the family and even the society control the bodies through different dif disciplinary practices and medical means. Now, Foucault suggests that as the family was bound to the state by the notion of collective social duty, it was the state's responsibility to provide assistance. Thus, it is important to make sense of the family, as well, families as well as the nation's gaze on the illness. In India, where the family has always been a key component of the society, placing the individual self within the nexus of family relations becomes even more potent, a potent factor in Indian cinema. So Sen positions Kuku in a traditional Bengali household where her ignorance, clumsiness, and dependency represents her as a constant source of embarrassment for her mother and her extended family. On the other hand, Niti's schizophrenic uh, condition is presumed to have been aggravated by her traumatic experience of being gang raped and consequently rejected by her fiance. This further illustrates how Niti's condition is not medicalized, but her body is seen to be an impure one with its chastity being defied. This underlines how the symptoms of the so-called mad woman are perceived, that is, whether they are seen as abnormal or threatening, and how is the stigma attached to the patient's condition understood by the larger community which remains blind to the struggles of every divine identities. Sen, through her directorial lens, also reflects on the role of the caregivers and how they identify pathways for the care of the 
mentally ill individual. It also makes the principles advocated by Foucault to control the divine bodies incongruous to other cultures and societies, especially India, where the concept of other is quite different. We can understand this through the character of Mrs. Gupta, the aging mother of Niti, who remains grounded in social conditioning to the extent of even inviting a tantric priest to exercise her schizophrenic daughter. However, when Niti is sent to the asylum, the viewers finds a resemblance resemblance with the Foucauldian belief that in asylums, all signs of the individual's own life, which lies outside the asylum, are obliterated. The asylum is functional, as we know, in reducing differences between individuals, repressing vices, eliminating irregularities, and denouncing everything that opposes the essential virtues of society. Thus, when Miti returns home from the asylum, her subjectivity seems fractured, her voice silenced by the unbearable torture she encounters there in an attempt to cure her. Thus, we contend that sense films establishes the need for realization of women's potential in multiple aspects of their lives, and despite their disability, their agenting, agentic approach inverts, contradicts, and presents an alternative to the commonly hold cultural codes of values, norms and, that are associated with a problematic female body. In Parumita Ragbin, Kuku claims her agency and gives voice to her embodied self through her maternal instincts and her innate ability to hope for an alternate reality where she would be valued. In one particular sequence, we see her repeating the same advice to her young nephew that she receives from her brothers. Do not waste food. Don't you know how many people starve? But at the very next moment, Kuku loses her balance and lashes out at the kid when he accidentally turns over the plate, scattering food all over the body. This scene captures Kuku both as a pathological subject and as a person with her own in intimate belief system. Kuku's self-image as a caring person is not nullified by the filmmaker since this image is, present is presented in multiple scenes in the film. Her dressing up as a bride or feeding his nephew should not be only seen as sporadic desires or imitations because she takes care of her ailing mother more than any other able-bodied member of the family. She also offers advice to her brothers to alleviate her mother's mental trauma caused by the daughter-in-law's departure. But the film nonetheless shows that the cohabitation of Cuckoo's self-image and the society's perception about her is almost impossible. Cuckoo constantly attempts to escape the psychiatric labeling as a mentally retarded or schizophrenic woman by the process of recuperation and self-recovery through meaningful role playing. An important part of this is to frame a positive discourse of special ability against the discourse of exclusion based on the ex expectations of a predominantly male institution of medicine and psychiatry. The latter described mentally ill women as having a dependent, maladjusted, and neurotic personality. In 15 Park Avenue, Mitali's relentless search for a home with her husband and five children must, that must be uh, waiting for her operates as the primary driving force in the narrative. It is perhaps problematic to suggest that the schizophrenic's reality is circumscribed by the non-schizophrenic world from within which Mita, Miti or Mitali enacts her conscious agency, but Miti's alternate reality is as real to her as the reality of her family is to them and as the reality outside and inside the theater is for the audience. Like many schizophrenics, Miti hears voices and responds to them. Her total commitment to finding the house numbered 15 Park Avenue, including making her sister drive to different locations to find the non-existent address, defines her psychological being. Nietzsche chooses to step into her own reality that everyone through the narrative told her does not exist. By making Nietzsche take the step, Aparna Sen demonstrates that the other side of schizophrenic reality is indeed a possibility that lies beyond the non-schizophrenic mind. Niti becomes invisible to us as she merges at the end of the scene with her real world, thereby destabilizing the meanings of visibility and reality. She becomes the wife, the mother, the professional in her reality and proves everyone wrong to deem her who deemed her disabled. By taking the giant leap, she speaks to the schizophrenics who fail to be comprehended by the society. It is perhaps an assertion of the coexistence of different types of reality, even if it is psychological and urges the audience to question the borderlines between the normal and the abnormal. 
The characters in these films divulge a selfhood with a disabled mind and in the process produce an alternative aesthetic with a selective focus on ability-based ideals that constructs one's identity. Both Kuku and Miti access a space that no one can influence and they enact their agency by stepping out of the cinematic frame and entering their own reality full of love and desire. These women's disabilities do not affect their sensitivity, empathy and commitment which their able-bodied family members lack. Through them, send questions and complicates notions like ability, functionality and desirability. Also through the creation of enabling relationships between themselves and people surrounding them, these women open up the possibilities for their empowerment, which cultural insularity and pathological labeling choose to ignore. Without dis uh, discounting their uniqueness of their abilities, Sen presents these characters as much more than their disabilities and makes it evident that disabilities do not define the totality of the self. That's all I have to say, thank you. It was plenty. Um, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, and if people have, have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat at any point and then we'll come back to them after our final paper. Ellie, are you ready? <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. And our final speaker for this panel today um, is Ellie Walters, who is an incoming DPhil student at Wadham College um, at the University of Oxford. She has just completed an MST in Women's Studies also at Wadham and in July 2020 she graduated from the University of Cambridge with a BA in Modern and Medieval Languages. Her research background is in French and Francophone studies with a focus on 20th and 21st century queer and disability literatures. And Ellie's title for today is Disability and Divine Embodiment in Aquakia Maisie's Freshwater and the Death of Vivek Oji. Um, the floor is all yours, Ellie. We're very much looking forward to hearing your paper. Thank you so much, Veronica, and thank you, Claire and Debashrita and Gabby, um, for all of your help and such wonderful papers. I was so absorbed in both the papers we've just had, and it feels very weird to now be speaking. Um, but I'll just share my screen. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting some of my ongoing research on the Tamil Nigerian non-binary trans writer, video artist, and Obanje Akweke Amezi. Um, in this paper, which is titled, as Veronica said, Disability and Divine Embodiment in Akweke Maisie's Freshwater and the Death of Vivekoji, I study the ways in which mortal impairment and Igbo cosmology intertwine through representations of the spirit child um, known as the Obanji. Just some content warnings before I start. Um, this presentation will include discussion of experiences of mental distress, self-harm, sexual assault, trauma, and suicidal ideation. Um, if you don't want to listen right now, that's completely fine. I can send you my um, notes and slides afterwards. Just feel free to send me a message on Zoom or email me, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Um, so, since 2018, Amazie has published two memoirs, Freshwater and Dear Centren, which came out in the UK earlier this month as well as a work of autofiction, The Death of Vivek Oji, and a young adult novel, Pet. They've also written short fiction and non-fiction articles for The Cut and The Paris Review, and their short story, Who Was Like a God, won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize for Africa in 2017. Their forthcoming publications include a poetry collection, Content Warning Everything, and a romance novel, You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty, both appearing in 2022. In this paper, I will be looking specifically at Freshwater and The Death of Vivek Oji. Both of these texts are legible as narratives of disability, as texts that depict mental illness and chronic, chronic pain. But Amazie's representation of impaired bodies and disabled embodiment is shown and shared in the context of South Nigerian, specifically Igbo cosmology, through the figure of the Obanji. The Obanji is an Igbo spirit born to a human mother, described in Chinua Achebe's 1958 novel, uh, Things Fall Apart, as, quote, a wicked child who, when they died, entered their mother's wombs to be born again, end quote, plaguing the family thereafter with evil rounds of birth and death. Achebe writes that if Obanji do not die before the age of six, they may be identifiable instead by sudden bouts of sickness and health. The Obanji itself is both human and non-human, both flesh and spirit. 
To quote Amazi, the whole point of the Obanji is that it's both. In short, the Obanji is a spirit child, an embodied god, one known for its ailing flesh and constant rebirth along familial bloodlines. Amazi's fresh water and the death of Ivekoji engage heavily with the sickness and health of the Igbo Obanji in a way that is informed and inspired by the author's lived experience. Freshwater follows Amazi's auto-fictional Obanje, named Ada, as she negotiates the spirits and sciatica that inhabit her flesh. The narratorial plane is occupied by Ada as well as her spirit others, known as her brother sisters, whose voices reach the reader from within Ada's skin to depict their embodied experience. The death of Vivek Oji traces the events leading up to Vivek's mortal end, relaying his undiagnosed sickness, an ambiguous quote-unquote thing steeped in spiritual dis-ease. In these novels, no line can be drawn between disability and divinity. Obanji flesh is strained and pained by resident spirits that cause chronic mortal suffering. I seek to explore how Amazi treats the indivisible experience of impairment and spirithood across freshwater and the death of Vivek Oji as corporeal distress is roused by divine embodiment. Um, just a note on terminology, like Gabby, I use throughout this paper Margaret Price's term body mind as a symbiosis of body and mind. Um, alongside talk of body and mind, Amazi uses the term spirit and flesh. In my reading, the body mind is made up of flesh and both body, mind and flesh are inhabited by spirit. Um, as I will explore throughout this paper, the melding of flesh and spirit and body, mind is intrinsic to Obanji ontology. Staying with a lover, Ada has an, epi an episode of panic. I quote, I'm having a panic attack and I don't know what to do, hyperventilating, feeling like I'm about to faint. Ada has not eaten all day and her mother reminds her that panic is exacerbated by low blood sugar. Headed for the kitchen, Ada remarks, when I tried to stand, my legs were nothing. I couldn't walk. My body was too far away. Ada's episode of panic constitutes just one instance of mortal distress tied into spiritual excess in the novel. Ada's body mind is said to endure trauma, migraines and sciatica. She Googles personality disorders and reads, quote, lists of diagnostic criteria, things like disruption of identity, self-damaging impulsivity, emotional instability and mood swings, self-mutilating behavior and recurrent suicidal behavior, end quote. Through a combination of divine intervention and some human reason, Ada feeds the brother sisters with blood through self-harm whilst feeding herself nothing but salad leaves. The brother sisters, those are her spirits, um, have Ada dropped to 118 pounds then to 114 and force Ada to reject psychiatric help claiming to keep them all, and I quote, safe from doctors and diagnoses and the medications they surely would have shoved into Ada. The brother sisters describe Ada's lived experience of her body mind as a litany of madness and explain the proclivity of the spirit ridden body mind to divine insanity. How do you survive when they place a God inside your body? We said before that it was like shoving a sun into a bag of skin. So it should be no surprise that her skin would split or her mind would break. The metaphorical split of Ada's skin is blamed by the brother sisters on their godly force, their parasitic, quote, dominion of this marble room that you call your mind. The emphasis on the marble at once evokes the clinic and the temple, places dedicated to body, mind and spirit, respectively. Although the brother sisters storm the marble mind, roaring like a tempest that, quote, didn't give a shit about humans, end quote, they also protect Ada from the trauma and memory of sexual abuse. One of the brother sisters, Asugura, whose name translates roughly from Igbo as machete, describes herself as a child of trauma, one born on top of a scream and baptised in blood. Her birth and baptism occur when Ada is raped by her partner, an event that reawakens Ada's trauma of sexual assault as a child. From then on, Asugura takes over Ada's body mind during all sexual encounters, shielding Ada from sex to protect her from further distress. Ada wasn't there anymore, at all, at all. She wasn't even a small thing curled up in the corner of her marble. There was only me. I expanded against the walls, filling it up and blocking out completely. She was gone. This blocking out of experience, in conjunction with Ada's multiple spirits or selves, evokes what Janice Harkin calls a dissociation model. This model describes how traumatic memory is preserved in split off ego formations and emerges over time through self-hypnotic trance states, flashbacks or fluctuating identity states. 
The parallels between dissociation or dissociative identity disorder and added split off, split off spirit selves have encouraged readers and critics alike to overlook the cosmology coursing through the text. Dominic Polsonelli, for instance, suggests that Freshwater employs the supernatural as a rhetorical means of understanding identity disorders, whilst Anna Bendy reads added spirits or brother sisters as allegorical embodiments of trauma itself. These oversights or omissions um, of a Maisie's spirit first perspective belong to histories of colonialism that shout over indigenous ontological realities, branding them as unreal. Some social scientists and cultural anthropologists have joined the colonial choir, seeking to explain the so-called Obanje phenomenon as sickle cell disease. However, Chinwe Achebe, that is the wife of Chinua Achebe, um, an author of a really crucial and wholly out of print text called um, The World of the Obanje, remarks the undue link between the Obanje and the sickle cell patient. Achebe confirms the impossibility of reading Igbo, or Banji, um, Igbo cosmology, quote, from the, from the perspective of Western scientific thought pattern, with its focus on concrete objective evidence analysed through a rational process, end quote. Unlike Freshwater, which narrates from within Ada's embodied experience, the death of Vivek Oji conjures Vivek primarily through perspectives exterior to his flesh notably those of his lover and his mother, as well as an, an, an anonymous third person narrator. It is through this chorus of voices that the reader learns of Vivek's thing, which manifests as mere quiet spells. His lover, Asita, notes that Vivek would sometimes become very, very still or walk as if he was drunk, staggering and stumbling. Sometimes his eyes hooded and unfocused, like something had seized him. Asita reports Vivek demanding, dismissing the gravity of small, small blackouts, as his mother sighs, he is not well. When Asita warns, don't mind him, his head is not correct, the novel dips into a discourse of unhealth and invalidity. Without the explicit references to a ontology, the reader is invited to consider the thing as symptomatic of some undiagnosed human illness or impairment to mold his experience into precedented psychiatric form. But Vivek emerges into the narr narrative fabric to tell the reader, I'm not what anyone thinks I am, I never was. These words are the first we hear from Vivek. They are the immediate beginning of his unmediated voice, which goes on to fill four Vivek authored chapters. From these words, he continues. Every day it was difficult, walking around and knowing that people saw me one way, knowing that they were, so, knowing that they were wrong, so completely wrong, that the real me was invisible to them. It didn't even exist to them. So. If nobody sees you, are you still there? These inaugural words push the reader to feel less comfortable in their diagnoses, to question how one might be not what anyone thinks. Although Ada and Vivek are perceived as mortally unstable, sick, and Maisie confirms the quote unquote major issue at play is distinctly spiritual. When Ada explains, I felt like I was starving, being eaten up by myself, I couldn't tell if it was real or them. She acknowledges the indistinguishability between real hunger and the starving sensations conjured by the brother sisters. No line can be drawn between sickness and spirithood in the Amazian diegesis. The Obanji body mind houses its spirits, which cause harm that is invisible, indivisible, and inextricable from mortal illness, impairment, and pain. Speaking to the New York Times in 2019, Amazi remarked, in Freshwater, you could say Ada is depressed and suicidal, but she's depressed and suicidal because she's a spirit trapped in flesh. So it's not one replacing the other. Both exist at the same time. Both exist at the same time, Amazie writes. As Amazie's autofictional protagonist, Adder is a spirit trapped in disabled flesh, a notion studied further by the author in an article for the Paris Review in December 2020. In this article, Amazie offers a first person account of their disability, including the pills and potion they must swallow to survive. So this is Amazie in real life. I quote, three different muscle relaxers three different muscle relaxants, two different painkillers, one for neuropathic pain, my antidepressants, my anti-anxiety meds, my acid reflux meds that work together with my asthma meds so I can breathe at night, my migraine meds, my inhalers, end quote. As their moods swing and their muscles spasm, Amazie shines light on the stubbornness of their flesh, which they describe as being as loud as my spirit, disabled and furiously alive. They acknowledge that this body is disabled, that it demands care and attention as it works to keep them alive. They write, my spirit bends worlds and does things that shouldn't be possible, not with the way my flesh or this world is set up, 
but I'm learning that my body is something to be reckoned with as well. In this article, which appeared after the publication of both Freshwater and the death of Vivek Oji, Maisie honours their flesh as something, as more than just a vessel for spirits, their flesh is something to be reckoned with as well. Divinity does not replace disability or vice versa. Both exist at the same time. And both disabled and divine, and Maisie brings their invisible or invisibilized ontology to the fore. My project in the literary medical humanities interrogates the potential of disability literature or body mind writing to unlock what Janet Price and Margaret Shieldrick call my own individual unshared, ultimately incommunicable experience of my body. And Maisie's writing borrows flesh terms like anorexia, asthma, dissociation, depression, to articulate Obanji embodiment, to make their experience intelligible to the human world, to make space in these words for the starving and heaviness of being spirit ridden. In so doing, Amazie enriches these mortal vocabularies, fleshing out those invisible and incommunicable experiences that lie beneath the skin's visible surface. I'd like to end with a quotation from Freshwater that captures the transformative potential of writing like Amazie's, whose words work like keys clicking into place, granting the reader access to new spaces where the unshared and unseen may come to light, where we may come to better know ourselves and each other. I've always felt like that, he said my whole life, but I've never been able to articulate it the way you just did. Thank you. And there's a bibliography in case you're interested. Amazing, thank you, Ellie. Okay, um, maybe we all need like a minute to sit with all these um, brilliant papers. If there are questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or use the raise hand function if you want to ask the question um, yourself. I'm just going to give everyone just a little bit of time to um, gather their thoughts. Um, I have lots of questions, so I can also make a, um, make a start if people are still thinking or are feeling a bit um, shy still. Um, okay, thank you all three for your really, really wonderful um, papers. What a treat on this Saturday morning. Um, I think I'm going to start with a question um, for Gabby, if that's okay. Um, you were saying lots of very interesting um, things and obviously very, very exciting that you're working in anthropology, but are using literature to kind of think through um, your research. Um, and I think I have, I think I have two questions or two parts of a question. One is you mentioned the concept which was new to me, so I'm very new to disability studies, generally speaking, but the concept of crit time so that formerly abled people um, struggle with the new amount of time and care and attention it takes to care and deal with their body. Um, and I was wondering in your research um, whether you saw any differences in people with different identities. So I'm thinking were there differences along gender or race, for example. So were there some people who are more used to having to care for their body in certain ways. So could you see a difference there? And I guess my second part was, did you introduce any of your subjects to the short story? Did you recommend the kind of story to anyone? Or is this something that you might now take forward in your research that you might offer literature um, or recommend literature to your subjects? Uh, all right. Uh, remind me if I don't answer everything. <laughs> of um, so, Crip Time is, I believe it's Alison Kather's um, Fem Queer Crip, Feminist Queer Crip, a text from 2017 um, that is stupendous if you haven't read it. Um, uh, oh, I got caught up in trying to remember her name. Um, so I think there was another part of that question there, but um, skip yeah, that. So, yeah, um, whether there were, whether you could, um, whether you were able to see any kinds of differences along 
Oh, gendered yeah, lines, I, I, I racial know. lines, for example, how people dealt with it or were more frustrated or less frustrated or whether Absolutely. there was any difference. Uh, so I was super lucky. Actually, it's really rare to get um, participation in studies like this. I was actually doing, um, I was a, like a sub project under a project for the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration in the US. And uh, they had no data on women. So I am actually, as of 2017, when I did this research, um, I have the only data they actually have on women, uh, uh, which was super wonderful to get. Uh, my participants were incredibly generous um, in sort of snowball data. Snowball data. Um, so in recommending like, oh, I met this person at a workshop um, and linking me up with people. So that was super rewarding. Um, there's a huge difference between women's experiences as amputees and men's experiences. And much of that comes from uh, body size, actually, and the way prosthetic fits, the way doctors treat them. Um, uh, class and gender have a lot of intersection there. Um, but unfortunately, uh, one of the issues that I did run into is I really only had white people. Okay. Um, and so that's something that I, I'm dealing with now in my dissertation is sort of what happened um, that created those conditions where only white people participated. Um, so I am looking at that. And then finally, I actually didn't read this story until this year, and my research was done in 2017. But I actually sort of love that idea. I don't know if all of my participants would have had been game for that. Um, but definitely a couple of them would have, and I actually would love to see. Actually, I might actually now reach out to one of my participants if I'm still in contact with and see if she has thoughts on this. So that would be, uh, that would be super. Thank you. Um, brilliant. I was just thinking because I, I think there's lots of research sometimes um, about how literature can help people kind of see themselves or maybe um, I just thought that would have been really interesting to see what, what um, the subjects in your research would have made. Um, of, of the story or maybe as a as a jumping off point to get into a conversation for example. Um, Love you. I really like that, thank you. <laughs> well, that sounds um, amazing and uh, fascinating, thank you Gabby. Um, any hands or chat? Oh, Ellie, Ellie has a hand up and then we have someone from the audience and now we have a long message in the chat as well. So I think Ellie, your hand was up first. <laughs> I'll be quick, sorry, just to um, follow on from what you were just saying um, about the, um, the kind of restorative and therapeutic um, potential for literature. And I was wondering if we could hear more about the short story, because I've not read it. I've only read The Left Hand of Darkness, which is very it's much deep <laughs> in science fiction. So I was wondering if this is a science fiction text and kind of linking that to what Deba Shrita was saying about um, the capacity for imagination to help women in these Hindi films um, sort of imagine these alternate realities in which things are much better and things um, are much nicer to escape their immediate circumstances. I was just wondering if there's anything like that in the short story or whether it's completely not that at all. Uh, yeah, so uh, neither, The Dispossessed is, I think, slightly less sci-fi inclined than Left Hand of Darkness. Um, there's nothing in the short story that sort of bends towards that. And actually, uh, one of the critiques that I actually have for the story is, um, so the character is, like I said, elderly and recovering from a stroke, uh, but she has a room on the second floor. And uh, one of the things I, you know, the revolution will be accessible. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think, in 1970s imaginary, even as brilliant as Ursula Le Guin is, uh, I think she couldn't sort of see her way through um, through that. So uh, it, I think uh, Deborah Shippers paper has a solid handle on more of the power of imagination um, in those roles. Uh, give me a second. I need to read. This is a very long message in the chat, and I, I would like to answer it. So if I think I think we have a hand up that was up beforehand, and then we'll we'll get to the chat. And I think shouting was next up, and then we have Sabina's question in the chat. Um, 
You're on mute. Okay, now we can hear you. Uh, hello, um, thank you for all the wonderful speeches. And I'm a postgraduate student from Taiwan. I just wonder, like, I have I've been participating in this uh, conference like for three days, and, and I noticed that you always said, uh, hello, uh, I'm white, European, and something like this. And I was just wondering one question is that, uh, for example, if I were the speaker, should I say that um, I'm an yellow Asian or, but I don't think I'm yellow. I mean, I'm quite white in a way. I mean, is this ever a problem for anyone? Because I don't know how to consider myself. Like my skin is not yellow at all. Like, and um, know how like, anyone can respond me, I, I think. <laughs> So, so I think that's, that's basically the auto description so that if we have a life, life transcript, um, but generally speaking, you go for whatever. That's just my opinion, what you feel comfortable with. For example, you might have realized some people go with their nationality. I, for example, I decided against that. So I, I um, define myself as a European woman and not by my nationality because nationality for me is a, a very complicated concept. Um, so you go with whatever what makes you feel comfortable and how you see yourself um, and terminology that is good for you. Um, and um, yeah, if anyone wants to chip in, that's just um, auto description. I think we just go, everyone goes with, with how they see themselves and um, what they feel comfortable with sharing in terms of their own identity or they might think that might be important for other people to know about um, them. I, I too had a problem with, uh, with this identification. I struggled with it. And then I think I'm gonna do what Veronica said earlier and just you know, use what I'm most comfortable with instead of saying, you know, I'm a North African or I'm an Asian or I'm this or that. It's too complicated <laughs> and I don't think it serves any clear purpose. So I share, you know, shouting your, your concern or at least your, your inability to articulate for others who, you know, you perceive yourself to be. Um, that's, so that's, that's an amazing, that's an amazing point. Um, I generally think that this is a good exercise for white people. Um, and I think that white people must be and should become more comfortable with seeing themselves as white and identifying themselves as white, which I think is something that people of color and black people have had to do for a very long time. Um, that's why I think this is a, a perfect exercise for white people to just identify themselves um, as, a, as a, a racial identity, which um, it is, it's not the norm, it's just another identity. But thank you. Any other? <laughs> Comments? Okay, wonderful. Um, I think then we can move on um, to Sabina's comment in the chat. Um, Sabina, would you like to read it out, pose the question yourself, or should I um, read it? I'm, I'm happy to read it. Um, awesome. Go for um, it. <laughs> so I wanted to start off just by saying thanks for the um, really engaging and, and intellectually stimulating papers um, in this panel because I was like furiously writing lots <laughs> of the whole way through. Um, so my my question was for um, was for Gabby. Um, I just wanted like, yeah, you sort of met, had these sort of three points right at the beginning of your paper, and I um, just sort of had like a flurry of, of thoughts about this, um, like distinction between being born with a disability and acquiring a disability, because um, it, it seems to me like, like really, um, uh, like a, a complicated, like disability is already very complicated and messy and, and varied and, and can be very very layered for different people. So I just wondered about like, so I was thinking about um, uh, like, yeah, just that there's like within that category of disability, there is just such a wide 
uh, range of experiences, some some that actually sort of um, uh, where like m- making things accessible can can Im- like involve kind of like contradictions between different different disabilities um, and just how like different impairments can accumulate. So um, somebody with one kind of um, disability might develop another kind of disability later on in life. And so like, is that experience of, for example, amputation, like how does that, how is that experience differently for people who already have some other kind of disability? Um, and I was also thinking about how um, like, We've the previous panel was there was somebody talking about um, endometriosis and um, we talked a lot about like the problems with um, the medical establishment often dis- disbelieving um, women and other um, marginalized groups when they have um, uh, illness or disability and so somebody might not get a diagnosis for a really long time but still be experiencing um, di- like disabling. Uh, effects of, of living in a in an ableist society for for a long period, and there are people who have a you know have developed a condition in childhood that's just not actually picked up on until they're an adult. So I just wondered if that um, distinction between being born with a disability and acquiring a disability is um, it like is it is easy to make? Um, and I was also thinking about um, like. Uh, disabilities acquired through birth because my older sister has cerebral palsy so she um her like disability was was caused as she was born so like that even like that category of like born and acquired is is messy as well so I'm just super curious to hear your thoughts on this I'm uh, sure so absolutely and actually your last example um shows the blurriness of that that line perfectly uh, so, and you know, there possibly should have been a fourth and a fifth premise also. So that premise was born out of, um, I had been reading uh, Sun Aura uh, Taylor's Beasts of Burden and um, Alison Kiefer. There's one other book that I can't remember right now. I'm so sorry. Um, and what I was noticing is that within disability studies, there is sort of an an ideal, there is uh, a rhetoric, and I'm not using that at all negatively, but there is a sort of um, political identity and comfort with being uh, disabled that I, that I see showing up very differently in my field work with people who acquire it much later in life um, versus something that you experience as a child and sort of grow into your body, I think, and figure out how to work through um, and sort of are more likely generalizing here uh, to acquire what I refer to as that native uh, disability understanding and the native disability political um, embodiment that, um, you know, if you lived as, as that very short quote, uh, the one woman that I spoke to, you know, she was 50, and then all of a sudden she had this amputation and she couldn't sort of shift her mind over as easily. But continuing to use her as an example, um, and this comes, Ellie, you might have heard this book as well, if you, um, this is where I learned about Margaret Price's article, is, oh, sorry, I'm blanking. I'm so nervous right now. I'm so sorry. Um, Sally Schultz, um, her 2019 book, it's about um, Black queer women fiction. It's body mind is in the title. I'm forgetting it at the moment. Um, but Sammy Shulk is the, the, the scholar. Um, and she has a, a nice discussion actually of um I'm forgetting the terms now, but if you sort of like able passing, but whether or not you have a disability and when it appears, um, and sort of when it can appear and disappear. This is not the terminology she uses. I know there's a discussion in there. I'm forgetting the language for it, I apologize. Um, But so that is, okay, I'm back to my woman now. Uh, So she had rheumatoid, uh, a particularly debilitating arthritis that started coming around the time she was 30. And so she was technically on disability um, for about 20 years but she didn't consider herself disabled until her amputation. And so some of that 
is about her perceptions of it and her being able passing, you know, her community didn't consider her disabled, but after the visible marking of the amputation, she both performed it differently and participated and was perceived differently. Um, so I believe that's my answer to the question. Let me know if I've left holes. Well, um, I just wanted to, um, I guess, follow, follow, um, follow up on that and just ask like, um, is, is that to do with the particular types of impairment or is that uh, to do with the like people's um, grasp or internalization of a of a more like social model of disability over a like biological model of disability? So if people have grasped from an earlier age, like I'm, it's not um, it's not me that's broken. It's I live in a in an ableist society. Then they're um, you know maybe it's to do maybe it's more to do with like a um coming up uh coming up like uh what's the word i'm looking for like a like the sudden shock of encountering certain forms of ableism in in certain ways rather than being tied to like specific types of impairment i don't know just throwing out ideas no no no. that's really good i actually didn't uh catch all of that can you can you jot some thoughts down actually on that for me? I'm I'm super interested in that. I'd I'd really like to follow up um, in in my own work and in my own thinking on that. Actually, please. Yeah, I'll I'll put some stuff in the chat so that we can. The, the, I'm not done. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lois. Super appreciate it. And and I think Ellie uh, very helpfully put the title of the book in the chat as well that you were looking for. Um, it's Semi Shulk's Body Minds Reimagined. Um, if anyone. Um, is interested in that, the, the title is in the chat. Other questions? Um, I think there's, there's, there's a comment um, by Paola, who says, amazing presentations, woo, and great questions, Veronica, <laughs> thanks. Um, I'm also working with a short story from Le Guin and may take on the idea of collective reading of the story with all participants, research fellows. Um, that sounds awesome. Um, obviously, as a teacher of literature, that will be the first thing that will come to my mind. I always like giving people stuff to read, right? Because then you're able to discuss things that might not feel that personal or as a jumping off point um, to feel people's um, ideas and thoughts. Other questions for our panelists um, or questions our panelists might have for each other. I, I, I can still keep going with some of my questions. Um, I think I might have another question. I can't see you still. Your Bashrita, are you still here? I have, yes, I have a question. Here. You're here, you're here, you're here. Um, um, I was... There I was some problem with my internet connection due to the heavy rains, so I'm really very sorry for it. That's fine. We can, we can I, still. We I can don't still. have anything to do with it. Otherwise, I would have fixed it. But I can see myself here. But I realize that people might not be able to see me. We can hear you perfectly, which is okay, um, that's, the most that's important fine. bit. And that's that's funny because where I am in Oxford, it's raining very heavily at the moment as well. So we're in the we con we're connected by the rain at the moment. Um, and the question I have for you, and I was really interested, um, I guess, by your juxtaposition between Western feminism and then what you were telling us about how disabled people or especially disabled women are perceived um, in Indian popular culture. And, um, and that disability very often is seen as a punishment. And I was interested whether this applies to both women who give birth to disabled children or people or women who are disabled themselves, whether there is a, a difference in perception, how this is um, maybe described or worked through in, in films, whether there's a difference um, or whether women who give birth to disabled children, whether they're shunned in the same way as people um with disabilities i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit um, yes like firstly, more cultural traits i would like to start by mentioning one thing that madness in india like it 
revolves around two parameters. Firstly, it can be a total or partial rejection of one sex's role, like the role mm-hmm. stereotypes, and also the acting out of the devalued female role. Thus, women in the Indian context, the disabled women, uh, even their mothers also, they remain doubly disadvantaged because even in the films I was mentioning about, like uh, one of the films uh, is uh, was produced in 2000. So there the director, like Aparna Sen, has done a really great work by bringing out the actual plights of the Indian woman, especially related to Bengali women. So being a Bengali, I can relate with it more because what like what the traditional customs believe is that if a child is uh, born out of wedlock, then, mm-hmm. and if he or she turns out to be disabled, then you have a solid reason to blame the mother for it because it was not out of a sanctified custom that the child is born. So, you know, like it's a sin, first of all, giving birth, engaging in such a, uh, like uh, intercourse outside marriage is a sin. And then what follows is the birth of a child where it's more like, the Almighty is punishing you. That can that is the most common kind of a notion that people tend to associate with such, you know, like the disabled children or their mothers. And secondly, like it, like for the mothers in these films, we see it's like uh, for in the previous, like the first movie, it's the director herself is playing the role of the mother here, and it's very mm-hmm. ironical because she is able to portray it in a very detailed way. This, these, all these movies are uh, like available in subtitles. You can watch it, and uh, you know, like she tries to portray it in a way where she cannot help it, but so- somewhere she is herself burdened with this daughter of hers because that limits her mobility that limits her choices also and somewhere we see her violently you know trying to you know suppress her identity as an individual and ironically at the end of the film she's her daughter is the only person who sticks by her side so that is also very like you know like i felt that that was a very eye-opening scene but and in the second movie we see the mother is an aged person so she her, do- her eldest daughter being a professor. So here the class dichotomy also comes in class and even caste at some points, but I will not go into the caste thing here because that will make the things more complex. So when we are taking up the class thing here for a, you know, for a person who's, for a disabled person whose elder sister is a teacher in physics, we often wonder how can the mother invite a priest in the house to, you know, like uh, rid her daughter of her sins. So that's a very funny situation that is portrayed in the household, but these are actual realities that we see on the screen. The only thing that is happening over the years from the 1980s, be it Bollywood, be it the regional film industries also, they are all trying to portray some alternative realities for these disabled people. And uh, it's not only about the cognitive uh, impairment, it's also about cases like dyslexia and other related things where we see that there has been a considerable change and that makes us to think beyond, think beyond the stereotypical notions that we have been raised with. Another film I would like to talk about is Margarita with a Straw. So here uh, there's a, the actress, uh, she's she's suffering from uh, like, I'm forgetting the, the like the thing she's suffering from, but she's a disabled figure and uh, mm-hmm. she, She's portrayed with her innate desires, okay, innate desires of having a normal college life, of having a boyfriend, having a married life. And that is, I think, you know, like somewhere we cannot judge them because of it, be it in the Indian context or any other context. So here what normally happens is that emotional or mental distress is experienced as very annoying and you know, inconvenient and tyrannical for the families because they need to manage them and treat and the management concerns, you know, gradually it revolves around with disbelief and pity. Now, pity becomes a very important factor here because when you look upon a being with those pitiful eyes, your engagement with them changes. So caregiving is also very important here. And also that, like in the the first movie I was talking about, we see that the 
person is very emotionally distant from her family and that leads to physical brutality and even sexual deprivation and in the worst case in the second movie we saw how uh, the character was sent to the asylum where she was undergoing shock therapy and long term psychiatric confinement these can actually have a reverse effect also which uh, in the long run like even in the reality it can prove to be i think more disabling for the characters and somewhere you know choke their own identities so that's what i had to say I'm mute. Um, thank you very much. That's that's really interesting. Um, I'm fascinated by this idea that there seems to be like a a sort of feminist or female alliance, sort of through um, disability, but also through um, the kind of cultural and societal consequences um, women seem to face through disability. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, if there are still questions and comments, we will would have a little bit um, of time left. Um, uh, there's, there's two comments. I think there's a follow-up comment um, from Sabine, um, which looks good. And then um, I think, oh, there's a, there's a comment for you, um, Debash Rita, um, by Paola who is thanking you um, for your presentation. Um, and she says that last year as part of Other Ways to Care, um, we screened 15 Park Avenue. It was co-hosted by Dr. Sonia Sowens, who recommended it. Um, Jaya Sri Kalatil, I'm sorry if I butchered that name, um, sh shared a text, shared us a text you published about the film. Um, uh, in, a, in a health advocacy magazine in India. Um, and she thinks that most likely you've read it, but just in case yes. you wanted to share the reference with you. Um, I can see a little hand, um, Josephine, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Hi everyone, thank you for your papers, super interesting. Um, I was wondering, and this is just really a point of reflection more than anything, but um, with, uh, Ellie, with your paper, I was wondering uh, whether Amazie uh, talks or, or uses the um, disabled, like disability framework when sort of working with her, her explorations of a bungee or if that's not really used because of the potential clash with like uh, Ibu cosmology versus the like kind of Western disabled model. I think you mentioned it a tiny bit at the end, but if you could talk about that a bit more maybe. Yeah, thank you so much, Josephine. Um, this is really interesting and it kind of changes. So Freshwater was their debut novel and came out in 2018 and they've released a book every year since then. Um, and their reflections kind of change through time as I think when writing Freshwater, they were also um, learning more about their ontology as, as like an Igbo deity. Um, and so their, their perspectives and um, thoughts about disability change throughout, but reading their most recent work, they talk a lot about, and this applies also to um, them being a non-binary trans person, how they use transness um, as well as disability as um, a framework to be intelligible. So for instance, they, identify as trans, but they say in Dear and that they, they identify in that way to get the treatment that they need. They've had breast reduction surgery, they've had a hysterectomy. Um, in order to convince surgeons to allow them to have the surgery, they're using, um, yeah, frameworks that, that, that humans understand. Um, when in fact, um, they say quite often that Obanji is, is not human and therefore has no gender. So the concept of being trans doesn't, it doesn't work together, but it's a way for them to exist in this world and be seen. Um, and it, I think the same goes with disability. They talk so much about, um, like for instance, when I list all of their medications and stuff, I think that they 
through writing this because I still it's all very unresolved in my head because sometimes I think no it's it's definitely that Amazie is using the disabled framework in order to articulate their um spirithood and then I think no but maybe their flesh is disabled and also um they are a spirit trapped in flesh so it all exists as one and the there's no single cause for any certain symptom um and when I read the thing that drew me to this in the first place is that I read the death of Vivek Oji first which has no explicit references to urban geontology to Igbo cosmology I read it and thought this is the most stunning disability narrative that I've ever read I related to it so much it's so di- so many different times throughout throughout the text um and then read Freshwater, which engages very explicitly with critical literature, like citing people who explain what an Obanji is. Um, the word is used so much, we literally hear from the protagonists' um, spirit selves. It, it essentially takes place within, this, within the spirit self, um, within the flesh of this embodied God. Um, and so that for me was me learning about the Obanji. And then I went back and read the death of Vivek Oji and read it completely differently um, and thought this is this is amazing. And I think both readings there are, val- are, are valuable in that I was able to read it the first time and think this is this is a disability narrative that has unlocked so much that I wasn't able to articulate beforehand. Um, but then at the same time, rereading it and thinking, no, this is completely not about disability and disability isn't. It isn't just, um, you know, the medical words that we have for it or, you know, the Western causes that we attribute to it. The body can be so much more than what we claim to know. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but basically um, they, they use the disabled framework alongside um, the, 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 div- the divine framework in a way that is inextricable. And they both exist very much at the same time. Um, like Amazie says, there's no, they don't replace one another. Um, it's sort of both and. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, it's so interesting. It sounds like such an amazing body of, <laughs> body of work to explore. I'm, yeah, keen to, keen to read some. Yeah. <laughs> we might have time for one, one more question. Um, final comments, remarks? Um, well, we might treat ourselves to a little bit of a longer lunch break before um, the amazing keynote um, at one o'clock. Um, please join me um, in thanking our three wonderful, wonderful panelists, um, Gabby, Debrashita, and Ellie. Well done. Maybe we can all um, very shortly unmute ourselves and give them a little... Um, a little round of applause. <laughs> well done. Thank you so much, all three of you, for your wonderful, wonderful um, papers. So much food for thought. And yeah, hope to see everyone at the keynote um, in 20 minutes. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Habib Zanzana. I'm speaking to you from Pennsylvania in the United States. It's morning here on a beautiful uh, Sunday, I'm not Saturday morning. Um, and I know it's raining in London, but I'll try to keep a very uh, uh, happy shine on this, uh, on this presentation. Um, I would like first to thank uh, Becky Rosenberg and um, Ben Dalton for organizing this uh, exciting conference on contemporary women's writing and the medical uh, humanities. Um, I would like to welcome our speakers to this session uh, titled Queer Health and Women. Um, Just to give you a quick description, I'm I'm an American. I'm wearing a a light blue suit with uh, a lavender shirt and a pink tie. So I, I promised you lots of colors on a great day in London. And so I dressed up for the occasion. Um, we will have three speakers and uh, I will be speaking last. 
Uh, one of our speakers, uh, Lizzie Merrill, was unable to join us um, today. However, she was generous enough to offer um, her presentation to you via email. So if you would like to read her paper and send us some comments, um, just reach out to me or to Becky and she'll make that um, presentation available to you. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Rachel Laluz, and um, she is um, a Joseph Armand Bombardier, doctoral student in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta in Canada. She uses a creative critical praxis to examine representation of drug use in queer women's writing, uh, women's art, literature, and the media. Um, so yeah, my presentation is titled Queer Eros and Recreational Drug Use in Contemporary Queer Women's Writing, Lori Weeks' Zipper Mouth, and Michelle T's Valencia. How do queer people in contemporary society today stronghold chemical interventions into their own brain and bodily chemistries outside of biomedical pathologizing or legal carceral contexts and how do these interventions relate to intensify or produce particular kinds of subversive pleasures what are the forms that drug use and queer eros take when considered in the realm of recreation of experiment in play what occurs on the plane of intoxication that is so critical for queer people who use drugs recreationally a small but significant body of work has developed that focuses exclusively on correlations between recreational use of drugs, sexual experimentation, and risk and pleasure on the part of gay men, specifically gay men who engage in what is termed chem sex, chemical sex, circuit parties, or party in playing. Several of these studies consider the use of amphetamines during these sexual practices, focusing on how stimulants provide a more complex understanding of how sexual and drug-related risk practices of these men are intertwined with their pleasure. Looking back in history, we see time and time again, writings on drug use and pleasure as especially glorified by male artists and philosophers, both straight and queer, arguably beginning with Thomas de Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, written in 1821, continuing on with the romantic poet's use of opium, from Samuel Taylor Coleridge in Wordsworth to Byron and Keats, Andy Warhol's substantial use of speed at the factory, Jack Kerouac's writing driven by benzedrine pills, and all manner of substance use by the beat poets, notably Allen Ginsberg's use of stimulants and other psychedelics, really any drugs he could lay his hands on, and Freud's writings on cocaine or Walter Benjamin's work on hashish. This is all to show that much less research and attention has focused solely on how experiences of pleasure are constituted and negotiated specifically by queer women in their recreational use of drugs. Indeed, representations of queer women's drug use are often framed through the eyes and experiences of others and are contextualized through official or institutional frameworks. Christopher Hallam's article, Dangerous Drugs, Dangerous Women, demonstrates this point. Hallam traces the drug bohemias that emerged in London during the 1920s and 1930s in the elite ranks of upper-class aristocracy. Women here, particularly those with dissident sexualities, those engaged in so-called sapphic relationships and who participated in fashionable drug use at the time, primarily cocaine. In Hallam's research pulled from Scotland Yard files, we catch a rare glimpse of queer women's recreational drug use in history, again framed through an official legal report criminalizing their activity. The report explains how London socialites Anthea Carew and Brenda Dean Paul booked a room at the Park Lane Hotel in 1931, where, according to Scotland Yard files, a night porter was called to their room during the night and he reported that he found both of the women apparently intoxicated and one of them was sitting on the bed in an almost nude condition. The other one was in bed. They were, in consequence, not regarded as suitable guests and were informed that their room was required. 
Upon discovery of the two intoxicated women, Brenda was committed to the Norwood Sanatorium, an institution famous for the treatment of drug addictions. More commonly, because the histories of queer women are often purposefully disappeared or erased from dominant records, women's drug use more generally is represented throughout history in medicalized terms. Women are described as patients or passive addicts. According to medical paradigms, we know that women were considered more susceptible to physical pain than men and were seen as unable to manage painful conditions. Women were consequently liberally prescribed opium and morphine in the 1920s and 1930s by male physicians to quote unquote, numb the pain of female trouble. Male physicians were quick to dose women hysterics with opioids an effort to subdue any unruly women patients into controllable invalids. As has been widely recognized, the 1950s and 1960s saw a spike of pharmaceutical psychotropics administered to middle-class suburban women housewives. Valium was widely accepted to be, quote unquote, mother's little helper with Demiol as a popular overprescribed antidepressant for women. A small, rather niche work of queer women's experiential representations of drug use is found in contemporary artistic creative outputs, particularly, as I examine here, in the work of queer authors Michelle T. and Laurie Weeks, whose books investigate the intersecting connections between queer sexual pleasure, eros, and an acutely embodied sensorial drug use that sees the protagonist of both books embody alternate psychic somatic localities so as to inhabit a different reality, so as to survive differently. In Zipper Mouth, Lori Weeks' unnamed protagonist falls in love with another supposedly straight woman named Jane. She explains, Love like liquid Xanax infused my spinal fluid. Fluid, A magnetic field flowing from her skin was drugging me. The two characters in Zipper Mouth trip in and out of what are described as primarily heroin benders, supplementing their opiate use with alcohol, chain smoking, amphetamine use, and psychedelics. The first time Weeks' protagonist professes her love to Jane is while they drunkenly snort cocaine together at a house party. In the bathroom, Weeks' protagonist looks into a compact mirror scattered with lines of coke, and in its reflection, through the powdered lines, watches herself in Jane, meditating on her intense infatuation before exclaiming, I'm in love with you. Later on in the novel, as the two snort heroin, Weeks' protagonist states, now Jane's body drifted next to mine on the bed. The bed bucked and spun in a muffled kind of way and Jane whirled beside me in our private tornado, her hair a mess, her eyes closed, all fucked up and oh my God. In lieu of touching one another, we snorted lines of dope. The tiny packet of dope had replaced my libido. Put your hand inside of me and your fingers would freeze in the numbing powder. Hearts pounding, Jane and I leaned across the mirror with a straw and sucked it up. These scenes show an increasing inseparability and chaotic interchanging between the drugs being consumed and the queer eroticism experienced by Weeks' protagonist. In the first scene, the materiality of the powdered cocaine line seems to mediate and then suffuse Weeks' erotic connection and relationship to Jane. Literally, Weeks' protagonist is seeing, feeling Jane through the drug. More directly to my point, in the second scene we have here, Dope is described as having completely, quote unquote, replaced or subsumed the libido, but perhaps beyond libido, the desire of Weeks' protagonist. To draw on critical drug theorist Ate Oksanen, we might think of drugs then in these cases not as separate and autonomous material objects that merely possess certain chemical compositions, but more so in terms of assemblages that come into being through their interconnectedness with this queer eroticism, with desire, with the methods of experimentation and play enacted by their users. The event of drug taking in this case coalesces or transmutates into an intense multi-dimensional erotics. Similarly, in Michelle T's Valencia, heavily imagistic, psychedelic scenes saturated with texture and color conflate drug use with a similar desire and erotics. T describes her desire for another woman as 
No mere crush. This was something huge. Feelings taking the form of a hot, wet gas that filled the bar, and I had to move through it with my drink, wading through the fog of my heart. Heroin for tea is quote-unquote liquefied sex, and she dreams about being shot up with this quote-unquote electricity. On the dance floor at a club, T and her partner Stella use speed together. Staring into Stella's eyes, T leans in to kiss her, and as T describes, it was like falling into a warm bath or swimming pool. My body was a ball of light. It was supernatural. Interestingly, as Peter Malins asserts, including pleasure and desire in our understanding of drug use could enrich in and complexify drug harm reduction efforts, working against dominant models of addiction that, as I briefly discussed already, frame the use of drugs, particularly for women, within narratives of suffering, trauma, and passivity, and that pathologize and often criminalize those who use drugs as only addicts or drug abusers. I should mention here that T makes the clear assertion at the beginning of Valencia that I've never been a drug addict or even an alcoholic. Pleasure is often erased in medical and criminal justice responses to drug use, including the development of drug policy and education, with the desiring female body, indeed the queer desiring female body, considered a particular threat to destabilizing these structures. Of the two authors, Weeks makes a special point in Zipper Mouth to contrast her protagonist's recreational use of drugs and queer desire with medical carceral discourses. Weeks's protagonist reminisces about listening to music and snorting drugs, stating, I was a lab rat in the basement of Bellevue pushing the buzzer for more drugs until I exploded. Here, Weeks splices together two key historical elements a reference to the testing of clinical drug trials using animal subjects in which Weeks' protagonist imagines herself quite literally as the object of scientific experimentation and Bellevue Hospital in New York City, once notorious for its, in some cases, forced intake of patients requiring mental health and substance treatment. Weeks' protagonist continues on to list the pharmaceutical drugs legally prescribed to her. I have to fine tune my nervous system every day, she says with such medications as Prozac to provide a base, Tegretol, an anti-epilepsy med designed to smooth those spiky brain waves and cut down on unexpected rage episodes, Ritalin, which helps focus supposedly, and finally Xanax, which takes away the anxiety engendered by Ritalin. Each drug, as she carefully notes, has a specific use and a specific intended effect. As Weeks's protagonist seems to suggest, the medical protocol through which she has been prescribed these drugs does not allow for deviation from the intended effects or use, though throughout the book, the ways in which she uses these pharmaceutical drugs, taking more than the prescribed dose, sharing the drugs, mixing them with other drugs, classifies her use in medical terms as drug abuse. As Audrey Lord famously explains in The Uses of the Erotic, there are many different kinds of power and what she terms erotic knowledge is one of those kinds of power. For Lord, as she states, the erotic is not a question only of what we do. It is a question of how acutely and fully we can feel in the doing. For both characters, auto-experimentation with drugs, the purposeful use of drugs outside of or in opposition to biomedical discourses, the psychic physical seizing of jouissance and ecstasy and pleasure, gives way to a special kind of onto-epistemological practice, a way of knowing and being. Scientific and biomedical discourses about drugs are connected to techniques of control, and these techniques make the female body, particularly the female body on drugs, an object of expert control and a major site of medicalization. As Lynn Hoffer explains, then, Eros might ultimately be considered the name for a way of living that contests scientific objectification and that presents new ways of surviving in the biopolitical present. The erotic knowledge mobilized by Lori Weeks's protagonist and Michelle T through their drug use in opposition to biomedical discourses might be considered then what Foucault terms as subjugated knowledge knowledge that has been pushed down and submerged out of sight by more dominant narratives. And it parallels the pharmacological knowledge of herbs and natural medicines, along with narcosexual knowledge that witches, midwives, and other women practiced and shared during the medieval period as a kind of unauthorized, non-institutionalized people's knowledge of medicine. 
especially in their use of what Silvia Federici claims included practices of voluntary intoxication and sexual and hallucinogenic self-experimentation. But despite the significance of this ontoepistemological erotics, this jouissance, the ecstasy embodied by Weeks's protagonist and Michelle T in their playful experiments with drug use, their individual pursuits of love, it is impossible to forget the conditions of precarity that these subjects exist within. It is precarity that provides the backdrop for this pursuit of pleasure. These are characters who live in abject poverty. Weeks's character is routinely threatened with eviction. T perpetually describes scrounging for food and cash and details her own experience of houselessness. These characters live on the margins of society in deeply subcultural spaces. There are moments throughout both books in which this precarity, a kind of darkness, pierces through the jouissance. T describes her friend Suzanne, a queer heroin user, who, she explains, was trying unsuccessfully to access help at a local San Francisco hospital, T states. The people at the hospital sent Suzanne away full of malnutrition and hepatitis. She was so sick that she died. She did not OD. The workers at General don't care about junkies. Everybody knows that. In Zipper Mouth, Weeks' protagonist bent over yet another mirror with Jane, her love, as she snorts coke, pauses for a minute to consider. We could plummet to our deaths at any moment. There is pain and suffering here in this pleasure. These are women who straddle the boundary between eros, pleasure, and thanatos, death, and every so often a brutal and indifferent reality, one in which death does indeed loom, emerges and punctures through the haziness, the dreaminess. Both characters seem to have a keen sensibility for the risk and danger they factor into their pleasure, their erotic existences, and ultimately their survival, a kind of a sharp foresight and an understanding that they perhaps too may not make it out of the chaos. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for your presentation. Uh, it's a fascinating topic and it was very beautifully delivered and very well written. So I look forward to the discussion uh, later on. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have questions. Um, all right, our next speaker then is uh, Kate Mandlik. And Kate is a cultural study PhD student at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Her, their current research explores lesbian and queer women's narrative of HIV and AIDS. And this work that she will be presenting today forms the basis of this paper. She also works as a casual tutor in social science and media studies. Um, so my presentation for today is titled Listening for Disorientation, Lesbian and Queer Women's Narratives of HIV. Um, and I do just want to note that this paper does include a brief discussion of sexual assault. Um, if this topic is distressing for you, please feel welcome to mute the Zoom chat or leave and come back for the next paper. I also first need to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Wadamadigal clan of the Darug Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would like to begin with an extract from an interview that I conducted with Ellen, an HIV negative queer young woman living in Melbourne, who is in a non-monogamous relationship with an HIV negative man. I'll return to this passage later, but I just wanted you to be able to sit with her experience while I discuss the broader framing of the project um, that is forming the basis of my PhD. She states, I remember a few months ago, I was in the Melbourne CBD and walking past these ginormous posters that were plastered along the sidewalk and they were advertising PrEP. And it was, well, my take from it was that they were primarily marketed towards men. The imagery I think was like two gay men on some of the posters and then like a very masculine looking poster, like strong framing and things like that. And I think that I had just walked past the posters, not really taking it in because it wasn't marketed towards me. But then my partner, who's a cis man, stopped and was like very, yeah, taken in by it. He stopped and I'd kept walking, but then he was like, hey, come back and look at this. 
Soon after seeing these posters, Ellen and her partner both decided to start taking PrEP, a practice referring to the use of antiretroviral medications to reduce your risk of contracting HIV. While Ellen did also consult online information provided by female sex educators before making this decision, it was, she recalls, only after seeing these posters that she began to think about the benefits of integrating PrEP into her own safer sexual practices. Ellen's initial understanding of PrEP as, and I'll quote her here, a drug that gay men took, speaks to the broader erasure of lesbian and queer women from Australian HIV discourse. In Australia, much like in Canada and the United States, we don't count lesbian and queer women in our HIV epidemiological risk categories. This means that if a lesbian or queer woman has had sex with both men and women and contracts HIV, her exposure to the virus is recorded as heterosexual. If she only has sex with women but uses IV drugs, her exposure is recorded as injecting drug use. And if she only has sex with women and has never used IV drugs, her exposure is recorded as undetermined. Because of this, we have no way of knowing how many lesbian and queer women are living in Australia with HIV, and little research has been done on how lesbian and queer women continue to encounter HIV in a time when HIV is more often thought of as a chronic condition rather than a death sentence. To address this gap, I've been using Sarah Ahmed's work on orientations to explore how lesbian and queer women are directed toward or away from particular HIV objects, knowledges and subject decisions. And I've been doing this through conducting a series of in-depth interviews. For Ahmed, starting from the idea of orientations allows us to account for how our positions in space direct us along particular lines and in doing so, bring certain objects into view. In turn, she asks us to consider how our bodies take shape when we follow the lines that are laid out before us. These lines and our orientation toward them are neither coincidental nor inevitable. Rather, their normalization is a performative effect of their repetition. It is, Ahmed argues, in following what is already given to us that particular lines become naturalized. As a result, our orientations and the work that is required to maintain them becomes concealed. Their effects are, to quote such attack, experienced quite simply as what it means to be. And yet we do not always follow the lines that are laid out before us. Lesbian and queer women, Ahmed argues, move off heteronormative lines when their desires are directed toward other women. In moving offline, this orientation not only affects who lesbian and queer women might choose as their sexual and or romantic partners, but it also interferes with how they might move in a world that is organised around what Judith Butler calls heterosexual objects. In healthcare spaces, this is evident when lesbian and queer women are asked invasive questions about their sexual practices or when their concerns about HIV are dismissed. For example, several participants I have interviewed recall either being, having been denied an HIV test or asked to answer extensive questions about their potential and perceived risk factors. One participant in particular stated, and I'll quote them here, there was another time when I wanted a test and they wouldn't give it to me. So then I had to pretend like I'd engaged in, I'm not joking, I said that I'd engaged in intravenous drug use in order for me to be high enough on the risk matrix to receive an HIV test. Encounters such as these work to remind lesbian and queer women that HIV spaces and knowledges do not always extend to accommodate their bodies, identities and desires. It is here that our orientations become both visible and felt. We become disoriented in their reminder that we are, to quote Sarah Ahmed, out of place. When moments of disorientation arise, straightening devices are used to restore us to our normative orientations. Sometimes the cost, the cost of being disoriented is high enough for us to welcome our reorientation. LGBTQ people, for example, are often hesitant to disclose their gendered and sexual identities to their healthcare providers. While there are diverse and complex reasons for these instances of non-disclosure, passing as heterosexual and or cisgender can allow some LGBTQ people to circumvent potential discomfort and discrimination. And yet being straightened can in some instances prove injurious. In Canada, Carmen Logie and Margaret Gibson have argued that when queer women contract HIV through an instance of violent homophobic sexual assault, such as curative rape, its description as heterosexual in epidemiological categories works to obscure both its violence and its homophobic origin. 
Here, lesbian and queer women's inclusion in HIV spaces becomes contingent on their compliance with already existing notions of what it means to be a person living with HIV. In doing so, their queerness becomes erased and they are forced to retrace the heteronormative lines before them. After engaging with this theoretical material, I was still struggling to envision how I might translate this into more tangible research methods. So to do this, I've turned to the life writing literature and have become particularly interested in Sarah Wasson's work, which focuses us on how we might talk about experiences of chronic pain. Here, she argues that illness narratives tend to operate under a particular temporal orientation, one in which the ill person is propelled into the future and in her example, into a future free from pain. While Wesson doesn't critique the narrative arc in itself, she suggests that conditions like chronic pain don't always follow these trajectories, in particular because they're so difficult to diagnose and cure. As such, in her own work, she moves toward a focus on moments or fragments of narrative that construct what she calls an emergent present. It is in doing so, she argues, that we can attend to experiences of embodied suffering outside of or prior to their reflective reinscription into the narrative arc. Following Ahmed's work on orientations, though, I'm particularly interested in Wasson's suggestion that fragmented narratives are, and I'll quote her here, infused with heterogeneous lines of force. When read alongside Ahmed, this suggests that in listening to stories that arise out of a moment of embodied experience, we might account for how our bodies and orientations are shaped by the force of particular discursive histories. In addition, she argues that focusing on fragmented narratives allows us to comprehend how our prior disorientations accumulate to form particular emotional effects. We begin, she suggests, to preempt our failure to be normatively oriented. We become anxious and frustrated when our bodies cannot extend into the spaces that are required of them. This line of thinking then promotes a focus on both the emotional weight of our embodied positionalities and the histories through which our orientations come to be. I'd like finally to return to the extract that I discussed earlier, where Ellen's partner calls her back to show her the poster about PrEP. Ellen's experience of seeing HIV prevention material is not unique in itself. In almost all of the interviews that I have conducted, participants have mentioned seeing these posters plastered on sidewalks at Pride events and in other LGBTQ spaces. But Ellen is the only participant that I have spoken to that has either thought about or made steps toward using PrEP. And what I find so interesting about her account is how she was stopped and reoriented toward this material. Sarah Ahmed talks throughout much of her work about the idea of being stopped. For Ahmed, stopping occurs when our bodies do not or cannot extend along normative lines. In particular, she argues that bodies that do not follow the lines of whiteness are often stopped in their tracks. People of colour, she notes, are stopped in airports when moving through security checks and by police when walking down the street. But there is something different about the stopping that occurs in Ellen's example. In HIV spaces, stopping can also signal that our bodies, identities and desires have been recognised in HIV knowledges. In other words, we stop and take notice of HIV prevention information when it is directed toward us. Others, like Ellen, must be pulled back, reoriented to face and take notice of objects that have for some time been in her periphery, but that circulate just outside of reach. In some ways, my thesis also works to pull lesbian and queer women back to revisit occasions when HIV has come into view. As one participant stated toward the end of our interview, and I'll quote them here, I didn't actually think that I'd have much to offer. And now that we've started talking, it's like, well, actually, when you think about it, it's like, yeah, hey, so thank you for the opportunity to veer into the topic a bit more and perhaps from different avenues than I originally thought. In doing so, this project both interrogates and enacts the, hey, come back and look at this, that Ellen's partner performs in her account. It is not external to the practices through which lesbian and queer women become oriented in relation to HIV. Rather, it is co-constitutive of these practices, both in its method of asking lesbian and queer women to produce particular kinds of HIV narratives in their interview, and in its more political position that these HIV narratives matter. Thank you. Um, if anyone needs the references, they can um, email me or contact me later. Thanks. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Kate, for this uh, brilliant paper. And uh, it was intelligent, well-written, 
and really beautifully presented. And your research fills an important gap, which is uh, research on HIV and its connection to lesbian and queer women. So I, I thank you for your presentation. And then we'll leave the question to the end of uh, our panel. Um, so now it is my turn to uh, present. Uh, I'll just say a few words about who I am. Uh, my name is Habib Zanzana. I'm a professor of world languages at the University of Scranton in Northeastern Pennsylvania. I teach Arabic, French, and Spanish, and I teach a course in English called World Literature and Translation. I have worked on uh, domestic violence and, and social responsibility in uh, Spanish cinema, and uh, I just submitted an article on uh, COVID-19 and violence against women in France um, after the lockdown. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about an, um, a Moroccan writer named um, Abdullah Taya. So today I'll be speaking about a, a book titled Un Pays Pour Mourir. I will make a reference to L'Armée du Salut, which is another book by um, Abdullah Taya, but my focus is really on MPE Pomolia. And I'll be linking medical humanities, Arab culture, and um, queer identity. Um, so when Abdullah Taya is both a writer and a filmmaker, he turned one of his film, one of his novels, uh, L'Armée du Salut or Salvation Army, into film. And he says that writing and making films are different things to me, uh, are not really different things to me. Or maybe it has become so. Making a film is a very long process and you have to be physically strong. The literary work is more mystical because it's the only writer, it's only the writer and connected to something inside themselves, all right? So I make this, uh, I will begin with the, with the connection between writing and cinema and I will end with that connection as well. Um, so in, Taya says that in all his books, the definition of the homosexual is never quite clear. Uh, there is always a crossing of borders of bodies and sexes. And we find that throughout his cinema and throughout his writing as well. Um, so Taya left uh, Morocco as a young man. And um, he explains that in Morocco, the group mentality dominated the society. And then he was invited to move to Geneva. And when he arrived at the airport, he was completely abandoned and left alone. The person who had invited him and told him and said that they were gonna care for him did not show up at the airport. And he ended up looking for support and a place to stay um, in the Salvation Army. So he says there's a very big contrast from the collective society of Morocco, where all these people are packed into small houses and the isolation he felt when he arrived in Geneva. And so then from Geneva, he moves to Paris. And Paris, he discovers that he's the other, that he has become an immigrant, an immigrant, and he has now been is seen as embodying otherness. Um, so he says that the immigrants are all drawn to a sultry vision of Paris. But once you arrive in the capital, they realize that they have an obligation to become French, as France decide they should be. So you can't be a Maghrebian, you can't be a Pakistani, um, you can't be a, a Taiwanese, you have to conform to this impossibility that this demand imposes on you, that this society, that this ideology. And, and this relates to a sense of isolation and then trauma that is felt both at the physical level and at the psychological 
And then he, he comments on France and he says, France is such a, a navel gazing type of society that's so sure of its history and its value that it will not take the time to listen to people. And that's where writing and cinema come in to fill that gap and to land the men and the women of Arab society and cultures to speak and to tell their stories. Um, so this book that I'm focusing on today, there's a close connection between sexuality, colonialism, and then the healing of a body. So Un Pays pour Mourir, or Country for Dying, is a novel penned by Abdullah Taya and translated beautifully into English by Emma Ramadan. Uh, and it was published in 2020. In this contemporary narrative, Taya explores the tension that exists between sexuality, colonialism, gender, and the construction of identity in Maghrebi men, women, and transgenders living as outsiders in Paris. So the focus of my, my presentation today is to talk a little bit about the, the different characters who struggle physically, psychologically, and medically to break free from their emotional and sexual confinement and the condition of marginality and erasure. Uh, now, so this is one of the early chapters unfolds in Paris, where Aziz, one of the male character, is a young exile from Algeria. And he's a prostitute. So he dresses up and works as a call, call girl, fulfilling bourgeois gay man fantasy. So he has sex with men for money, and but he plays a role that they expect uh, him to produce for them. So this is what he said. I prostituted myself as a moderately savage Arab boy from over there, Algeria. The clients like that. They like me to smell like my home country, the savagery of the village, as they like to say. And then later on in this novel, Aziz has a gender confirmation surgery under the medical care of a Swedish surgeon, Dr. Johnson. And the same Aziz, before he goes into this surgery, recalls moment of his childhood in, in uh, Algeria. And then he recalls a ceremony of gender reformulation and equation that took place in his mother's home, inside the home, in a private space. And it was orchestrated by the sisters. The mother was absent, she went to the market, and the sister created this atmosphere of gender fluidity and enabling the young boy to sort of transition into a girl. This is how, so the transformation is all, you know, play, chat, but it's, it's very important at the psychological uh, level. So the transformation began by dressing up the little boy in deliciously vibrant fabric and colors, borrowing his mother's green kaftan, the aunt's yellow scarf, and a pair of babouche slippers that belong to the elder sister. Now today, when the, when the story is narrated, the adult Aziz has now adopted the Arab female name of Zenuba. And he describes the ritual of gender reassignment or confirmation in, in very simple and logical math, mathematical terms. So this is what he said, this is what happened. The event, transform, be reborn, return to the source. I didn't question it, just like when I was a little boy. Seven girls, those were his seven sisters. One boy equal eight girls. One brothers and seven sisters equal eight sisters. The rule of numbers, it's logic. I witnessed my own transformation it wasn't magic, it was real. So after his gender reassignment or confirmation, 
He wants to call up his sisters and tell them, I'm one of yours. I belong. I'm a, we are of the same body. We are of the same gender. And that is through the medical procedure that he had invested in both psychologically and emotionally and physically and financially as well. Uh, so gender, this fluidity of gender, is the mechanism by which the marginalized are marginalized, according to Costin and Kimmer. That is, gay, working class, or disabled men are seen in the capitalist society, not as men in the popular discourse of their marginalization. It is their masculinity, the site of privilege, that is specifically targeted as the ground for exclusion, okay? But for the young boy, the Aziz, it was an important transformation. He says, I was happy without shame. A dream, I am the only boy on earth, I am the only girl on earth to transform, to be reborn, and to return to the origin. And then, so writing, and then being holding the camera, and then speaking the voices of men and women is a way for him and her to transition and to make her voice heard and to claim their space in society, both in, at home in Morocco and in Western society. So he's, he was nurtured by the free and benevolent gaze of his sister, and then one, two, three, her several sisters, and then he reaches and go beyond the limit of this world. I was a little boy, I'm now a little girl, and then king and queen. So how does the performance of gender occur? A country of, for dying sheds a light on the intersection of the medical humanities, the female body, and the, per, and the performance of gender in postmodern modern Western culture. Uh, and, this, and so this is a crucial moment in the novel. After her surgery, Aziz has become Zenuba. So after her surgery, Zenuba reflects on the loss of her pre-transition male persona and begins to integrate, interrogate the category of gender, her own fluid sexual identity and the social construct of identity and womanhood. So she poses this really important question. She says, I don't regret anything that I've done. I wanted this operation, this disappearance. I wanted the penis to be gone. I'm, you know, I'm the one who planned it, orchestrated, financed it. I brought it to fruition. And I thought of everything, but not of the essential, how to be a woman. I mean, beyond clothing and makeup, what is a woman? And this is the question that Aziz and then Zenuba struggles with throughout the, the novel. So in order to understand this internal conflict, you have to remember that Taya is from Morocco. And when uh, people talk about homosexual, they tend to see only two people of the same sex. But Taya argues that it's really in homosexual discourse and in homosexual relationship and in expression of sexuality, in queer sexuality, it is all to be invented. So he says, it's because homosexuality is forbidden, not seen in a positive way by many people in Morocco and, and throughout the world, really. It doesn't mean these rules will always be the same when you meet someone. This is what I like, this inversion. Condemnation, because you can go to prison up to five years in North Africa, in the Maghreb, for being caught or you know, having a relationship with a sexual relationship with a man. Condemnation, and then prison become freedom. And then for me, there is no special, specific sexual role, top or bottom, there is just you know, an invention. You reinvent yourself. Um, so 
I want to address another topic that uh, this novel also is a political text that speaks the language of childhood and truth and body and healing. So A Country for Dying is a very political, very much about what's going on today in our post-colonial world, about France and its shameless exploitation of Arab immigrants. And so, and to say all that, Taya said, I had to make, create a link between this and what I lived, what his own experience. So the language of childhood is the only true truth. The rest is all made up and accommodation. So he goes back to the childhood, the words he spoke, the film that he watched, and uh, the, the intimacy of the, 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 the closeness of, to his sister and his mother, and that created the language of the body and the language to which, with which he writes and speaks about his experience. And then this interesting thing, um, you probably all heard of the Turkish bat, the Hammam, but the Hammam is a very interesting place in uh, North African society. Uh, so it's a, it's a public bath. In the morning, women come to the, the hammam. In the afternoon, the same space is shared by men. So there is usually a towel above the door to indicate that this is the time for women to be there. And here, women feel very liberated. I don't know if you've read, for example, Tahar Ben Jalur, L'Enfant de Sable, um, sand child, where he talks about a scene in which the women go to the hammam and talks about sexuality, about sex, about sperm, about their bodies, about their illnesses. So hem, there's this notion of the hammam is very important. So the hammam, Staya said, as I lived it as a child, because boys up to like seven year old can go to the hammam in the morning with the women. They're not considered or viewed as sexually you know, awakened yet. So the hammam as I lived it was not the, the very racist and orientalist view of the bath in the West. As a little boy, I had no idea about the West. We didn't care about the West and what the West thought of us. When I write, I try to always stay true to this space. Me, a little bit of feminine, my six sisters, sisters, my mother screaming and trying to find food for us, my father continuously falling in his cigarette, the desperation, the poverty. And yes, there was a way, always a way to survive. And the way to survive is also to be able to speak. And the hammam provided women with the opportunity to create that intimacy. It could be also intimacy between women as well sexuality between women, but also to the spoken word, to language. So one of the characters in, uh, is a prostitute in the, in the novel that I'm discussing, A Country for Dying. One of the main characters is Ahira. She's a 40-year-old prostitute who offers her body, who sells her body, uh, but has a different attitude toward immigrants who live on the margin of society. And this is what she says. Often, they don't have a lot of money, these immigrants. I never dare send them away. So I sacrifice myself, if I may say so. I feel like a sister to these Arab men. It has become my specialty. Arab or Muslim men in Paris, most of them without papers, most of them worn out by this city, which mistreat them without remorse, and by French bosses who exploit them illegally without guilt or feeling. Um, so this is where also the body becomes a tool to bring these people from the margin into the center and give them some kind of place to be recognized. Um, so Taya is a, is a Moroccan man and he's queer. He's one of the first queer actually the first queer uh, Moroccan or Arab or Muslim who have come out and spoke about homosexuality. 
So he says, I'm an Arab, but for many things, I'm not like an Arab at all. I'm not only coming from Islam, not only from my Arabic society, but there is also this homme primaire, this primal man inside of me who is still alive. Um, and in order for him, for this young boy, to find his identity in a very sexist and heterosexual and hypersexual and aggressive, aggressive society, he had to transform, all right? So in the Moroccans of the 80s, where homosexuality did not, of course, exist, I was an effeminate little boy, a boy to be sacrificed, a humiliated body who bore upon himself every hypocrisy. But by the time I was 10, though, no one spoke of it. I knew what happened to boys like me in our impoverished society. They were designated victims to be used with everyone's blessing as an easy sexual object by frustrated men. So he was seen as actually a, the predator because of his tender young body, because of his effeminate ways um, or manners as they were perceived, he was considered a, a, a predator and the aggressive sexual men were considered or viewed at by society as victims of this temptation. So what he did was like found refuge in silence and later on in writing. Um, so I'll finish very quickly now. So when the novel is divided in three moments and um, in a style, and then there are different voices that kind of weaved together. And uh, it's very much like uh, the story of Shahrazad in the one and thousand and one night. So there was, but these, all these stories are intertwined to the body, to the, to the, the power of transformation and to healing, but at the psychological and the medical level. So there's a link between the three fragments, his own physical transformation, the transformation of the body, and that the psychological and the sexual awakening. And at the same time, to talk about me, to speak and to say. So I will, um, and then so I will conclude with what I had uh, announced earlier, then cinema becomes a way for this young child who has become a, a girl to express himself. So cinema, he says, save me as he did when I was a child and had no place to go except the cheap movie theaters in his hometown. Um, so this book uh, is a melancholic book and melancholia is, you know, is, uh, is a condition that Daya has struggled with. And he wrote a different novel called uh, Arabian Melancholia. Uh, so it's a me melancholic book. It doesn't give an optimistic or positive view of homosexuality because it was never the author's idea to give a positive view, okay? I never think of it in terms of positive or negative. In Morocco, when I discovered that I was a homosexual, men always expected me to behave like an effeminate boy doing the female work. So I stopped seeing them immediately. Um, and then cinema becomes then the tool to affirm his queer identity and to make a statement and to bring the people, the marginalized individual into the center of the discourse on power, identity, sexuality, and the self. All right, thank you very much. I will stop here. So we have uh, plenty of time, right? To, for, for, yeah. I cut my presentation short because I didn't time myself and I don't wanna, but I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So um, I will first, like to hear from our uh, audience if they have any questions, comments, uh, and then I will open the, the discussion also to uh, so that the different uh, speakers can communicate as well. Hi, hi. Okay, hi. 
Um, I was just uh, curious because I think in one of the presentations from yesterday there was some uh, discussion of the um, kind of Parisian um, cabaret scenes mm -hmm. um, and the kind of uh, like trajectory of the development of the categories of uh, transsexual and transgender in that um, in that kind of uh, Paris context. So I just was uh, curious about this um, the kind of like uh, I guess like counter narratives of d different kinds of trans identities that are maybe more um, are sort of more in conversation with queer and uh, homosexual identifications. So I wondered if um, if you had any had any thoughts on those, like because I, I think that that sort of like Parisian cabaret scene is the uh, the like. I guess the the maybe like the, the the usual or the normal route that people from um, uh, the UK and the US who are working on trans studies have in thinking going into thinking about trans identities in in um, in France, but I, I like I don't know how much of, like awareness there are there are of the kind of very much like differences uh, in in uh, in France. So yeah. Um... Yeah, the, in, in Taya, it's, uh, sexuality is also a performance, and it's a performance of, of the body, but it's also like the quote that I gave earlier of the young boy fulfilling these fantasies that the gay French elite has about uh, or has absorbed about, the, about North Africa and, and uh, colonialism. So there is this... And I think in, in Taya, there is this tension between his desire to sort of uh, bring out the colonial past, but also to celebrate the body of the young individuals. And um, so it, it's interesting because most of the characters in these novels uh, live in the margin of society and they're mostly prostitutes who have made a living out of you know, their own bodies, and then and they have struggled throughout. And yet, they look at television, they look at movies, they look at, at uh, music as a way, sort of a, uh, of, a, of the cabaret style of leaving the awfulness and the difficulty of their life and escaping to this perceived notion that cinema can open the door to a better self and a, a more satisfying sense of identity and, and reality. Do we have more questions? I have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, so first of all, I had a question for you. I, I, don't, I haven't formulated it in my head, but I'm gonna get there. I haven't read Taya and I was very interested and I'm always interested in the intricate and complex way homosexuality is dealt with in North Africa. And I'm a Francophone um, uh, researcher, so I know it a little bit. Thus, I had two questions. First of all, I was wondering about the reception, both in France and in North Africa. How, how was it, uh, the reception of, uh, of the book, this one or, or several? And uh, my question is tied to something I remember randomly, and you probably know about it. Uh, there was a film a very long time ago, called Chouchou with Gad Elmaleh that was talking and, and representing. We talked about cabaret, we talked about homosexuality. It was a comedy. And I remember watching it and thinking that a lot of the elements in that movie were very disturbing to me at the time. It was a comedy and representing, again, uh, uh, a gay man sort of in a relationship with a French person, there was a lot of uh, a lot of tension, right? Uh, racial tension, post-colonial tension, uh, economic tension. So I was wondering, how do you see it in that paradigm? In the integration of you were talking about the the this minority integrating in one way or the other with Paris life, which was a very uh, you know eccentric scene. So I was wondering how it's dealt with in the movie and if you have any insights of how it's dealt with politically or culturally, I'm wondering about what's happening right now in France. And while you think about it, I had a very quick question for uh, Rachel. 
and so, so I can uh, talk to all of you and we can talk together. I don't know if you're a Francophone, Rachel, but I was thinking about another book in the, in the context of uh, Eros, Thanatos and uh, Drugs, uh, which was Virginie Despentes' Besmois. It's a very well-known, uh, um, uh, it was a bestseller, and it has, it, it talks about relationships between this relationship between these two uh, liminal and minoritized women uh, involved in a lot of, uh, let's say, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll type of scene. So I was wondering uh, if you explore the, the francophone scene uh, when it comes to, uh, to drugs and queerness, and how do you integrate so different, um, let's say, geographies, right? Or if you are only in the uh, Anglophone literature. And I had a very short question for Kate as well. I was wondering about, so I work with uh, in medical humanities and I think a lot about sickness narratives in, uh, and HIV as well in uh, Quebec contemporary literature. Uh, and I start my, my research with the HIV pandemic because in the 80s, the discourse changed, right? The, the implications and the dialogue between the doctor and the, uh, the patient, especially the AIDS patient, uh, patient and the, the AIDS narratives sort of participated in what we're doing right now, like liberating the voices of the patients and being able to sort of communicate about your, your, your body-ness. And because you talked about uh, Sarah Ahmed and uh, about a couple of other things, I was wondering from the, bo- the, the passage, let's say, or the, 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 tra- the way to traverse the bo- from the body, the, the, the HIV implications, the objects that are there, to the affective element, what does it do in terms of affect theory and in terms of lived and... Uh, how should I put effective life in, in what you're doing? I was wondering, so the, everything I do is, has, is it, it's embodied, right? And I was wondering about this passage from that poster, right? The prep poster to what does it do emotionally, effectively to, uh, to the participants uh, at, in, in your dissertation. Thank you all. Okay, I'm gonna let my, the, the other participants speak. First. Um, Okay, maybe I'll respond to the question. Um, Yeah, I appreciate your question. I'm not Francophone, so I unfortunately I haven't um, read or heard of that book, but it it sounds amazing and it sounds like something I I wish I could kind of access and use in my own research. Um, I'll I'll send you a message with the. Please do. (laughs) Yeah, please do. Maybe there's a translation or something for me. I think there might be. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, I, in terms of like thinking about extending this research to different geographies or, or kind of, um, different populations of queer women, that's, that's exactly kind of something I'm trying to figure out how to pivot myself, where do I want to extend this research out? And I'm even thinking in terms of like ages, like whether or not I want to focus more on like the queer women's like buildings, Roman and focusing more on like perhaps teenage um, recreational drug use or where exactly. So I'm not really sure so so far, my research is mainly focused just on North American um, representations of drug use. That's just what's been most accessible to me. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm really open to trying to understand how, how I can make the research more diverse and, and contextualize other experiences too. I'm happy to answer next. Um, That's if you're finished, Rachel. Um, Thanks so much, Chris, for the question. And yeah, affect theory is a huge part of, um, I mean, everything Sarah Ahmed does. I think what I found really um, interesting about the interviews that I was conducting was that so many participants didn't feel as if they had a strong emotional connection to HIV or didn't feel as if they had um, just a strong personal connection in general. And it was only through these quite specific questions I would ask that you'd get this really kind of detailed, complex narrative. Um, But I think that the emotional responses come out in two ways. I think in part um, through 
distress is perhaps too strong a word, but through the realization that if they wanted to access something like PrEP, um, that it would either be quite difficult or they'd have to negotiate it in quite specific ways from their doctor. And that comes through experiences of not being able to receive an HIV test and um, other various um, contextual things. Um, so I think it comes out there. But also, um, I'm currently writing a chapter on affect theory at the moment, thinking about how even those participants who don't have um, strong emotions about HIV or, or claim not to um, use their feelings about uh women who in the 1980s were caring for gay men and doing a lot of that nursing work um, and how their sense of um, perhaps admiration or respect for these women um, helps them to build their lesbian communities in the present and what that means for their um, contemporary acts of community building. And I've been thinking a bit about Sarah Ahmed's um, language of how emotions get kind of stuck to people and things and thinking about how perhaps um, particular emotions about HIV get stuck to queer women because of their proximity to queer culture and to gay men. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. And Kate, following that, how do the how do they see their own body, the self, the perception of their own body in a condition of illness, for instance? Yeah, so almost everyone that I interviewed wasn't living with HIV. So um, it was the interviews were more about um, navigating uh, testing and. Um, uh, prevention information and things like that and safer sexual practices. Um, so I think uh, most of the conversations I had about people's experiences and feelings about their bodies was about whether they thought of their body as at risk or not at risk of contracting HIV. Um, and I think for the most part, and I think this is um, mostly due to the erasure of queer women in HIV discourse, um, people most often didn't think of themselves to be at risk of contracting HIV, um, mostly because their sexual practices were with other women, which is seen as, as very low risk. Um, yeah, thanks. And then I, I want to ask uh, Rachel a quick question. I was struck by the choice of, of some of the quotes, um, for example, that you talk about, you know, the, the sexual ecstasy and the jouissance, and you and I quote a couple of, of words like hot, wet, gas, and then there's an explosion. Is this, this is there a conscious effort on the part of these authors to try to convey through language the explosive nature of what is going on, both at the physical and emotional and mental level? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. That's something I noticed for sure between both books. Um, the writing is so heavily embodied. It is so sensorial um, and it draws so deeply on sensory experience and kind of kind of touching on what you're saying too in terms of like explosion and wet and, and drawing back to the body. There's like a real... Um, there's like a real pull both writers have to speaking to this like feminine abject and um, they focus, I mean, there's just so much to pull on from both books, but they focus a lot on liquids and saliva, mouths, um, other bodily orifices, um, more of this focus on the abject and this writing that's like so imbued in physicality. Um, yeah, really interesting. And interesting. that relates to what the French called the uh, you know, like the creature feminine like yes feminine. <laughs> yes yeah exactly i mean it, i definitely think i definitely think that would be an appropriate parallel for sure okay. All right, good. Oh, well, i'm not ignoring your question uh chris <laughs> All right. uh, but i just want to give the audience and this, the other speakers uh, the opportunity to share their thoughts as well I know. I don't, I'm not missing any hands, Rebecca, no? I'll, I'll ask one. I can't raise my hand because I'm one of the co-hosts, but um, uh, I had a question for, um, first, well, firstly, thank you for your papers. I thought they were really interesting and brilliant. Um, for a question for Kate, I was wondering whether um, I really, really like, I mean, I have no idea about sociology or anything like that, if, if that's the kind of, you know, the field, your field you're operating in, but I really kind of appreciated how it was, it was very literary in a way and like bringing in affect theory, um, kind of mapping out across the humanities. I thought that was really interesting. Um, 
I was wondering if you could talk more I, again I don't know whether this is ethical or not to ask but I was just wondering if you could talk more about like this the the groups of the people that you interviewed um because it struck me that when Habib was talking about you know like queer identities and I think Chris's question relate no Chris or Sabine's question maybe related to this this idea of like queer identity Paris you know excess you know sex work and stuff it tends to be kind of like filtered or transness rather filtered through like a white gaze or like white bodies and so looking at it through the Moroccan lens it's more like intersectional in a way so that got me thinking about your kind of sample group if that's the correct word your interviewees and like um particularly you know obviously Australian context with like aboriginals and like healthcare and I was just wondering uh, like is does that feature as part of your research at all um is it kind of like is there an intersectional kind of like critical race theory kind of aspect to it or a decolonizing aspect to it given Australia's less than stellar should we say um history in terms of like you know aboriginal healthcare and like you know um dealing with trauma and what have you Yes, thank you for your question. Yeah, really important. Um, so for this project, I didn't ask participants about um, about race. And given the COVID-19 circumstance in Australia, most were conducted over Zoom over the phone, um, which, um, again, kind of puts a barrier between um, getting to know people interpersonally during an interview. Um, so race didn't surface in my questions as um, something that was discussed, but some participants did bring it up, in particular when talking about um, uh, queer spaces and how they would encounter or not encounter HIV information and HIV organisations that exist in Australia in queer spaces. And in particular, it came up around people who were critiquing those spaces as um, primarily uh, for cis white gay men and how people of colour, um, women, etc., don't always feel comfortable in those spaces and that can um, provide a politics of exclusion in from those spaces. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really important field for future research to explore, particularly Indigenous Australians and other people of colour living in Australia. So thank you. Okay, I will address your question. Great. Um, okay, the, the, the first book that Taya wrote called uh, L'Armée du Salut is the one that really created uh, a great deal of, that opened the dialogue about homosexuality in in Arab, in the Arab society, and um, and created a great deal of tension. Um, as I said earlier, Taya was you know, the first gay Arab to come out and speak, and then he spoke in very sexual terms. This novel that I discussed today, there's no mincing of words. There's no so he used sexuality uh, in a very sometimes very crude. Uh, terms. Um, he also wrote uh, a letter to his mother. His mother is illiterate, uh, poor. She, the father, abdicated abdicated his you know his authority in the home. He declared himself depressed and unable to provide for the family except for the bare necessities. So the mother took on the responsibility of the entire household financially but also raising the children uh you know educating them the best way she she could possibly um, afford to do because her time was very limited and she noticed very early on that the young abdullah you know was what he called special all right so he wrote a letter called l'homosexualité expliquée à, à ma mère and in which he articulates in very you know, simple terms what it means to be Arab, what it means to be queer, and what it means to be Moroccan at the same time. And, uh, and then let's go back to Paris for a minute. He, he was also, a question that often comes up with Taya is they say, the French people ask him, the French journalists and the public ask him, why don't you write in Arabic? Why do you write in French when you're really wanting to bring the people from the margin to the center? It's a question, it's a difficult question uh, for him to answer. His answer has been pretty consistent. He learned 
that French, well, he spoke Arabic only at home and in the streets. And when he went to Rabat, the capital of Morocco, he heard the Moroccan elite speak French. And then he understood that French was a language of power, of social mobility. So he learned French in order to access this language as a tool to gain power. And eventually he manipulated or utilized the language so well that he became a famous writer and that his voice is just as important, he believes, you know, uh, in the discourse on sexuality, Arab identity, queerness, and colonialism and post-colonialism. Um, so, and now he's gone to Morocco several times to explain the situation what it is to be gay and to you know support the movement for queers in the Maghreb and whether it's Morocco, Tunisia, or Algeria. In terms of cinema, as I said earlier, he adapted the film L'Armée du Salut, Salvation Army, into a film. And this film um, is takes place in Morocco. And what you see is the, you know, the streets of, you know, a small town in Saleh and Fez and Casablanca. He, I think he struggles and he works hard at not reproducing the Western view of this Orientalism that Edward Said has, you know, uh, discussed. So I think he works really hard in his representation but in textual representation and in, in cinema to give as much as possible a voice and a representation that is not too wild to uh, you know, fantasize, but to correspond to the reality. Just like the French that he uses is very simple, straightforward French. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't look for you know, the metaphor, and yet his language is very poetic and very rich. So what we see in cinema is not the burlesque and the fantasy and everything else, but more a, a raw depiction of human desire and sexuality. Thank you so much. I think Sabine wanted to say something before. Sure. Oh yes, please. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I was, my um, uh, question is, is for both um, Kate and Rachel. Um, I was just wondering um, in what ways uh, like trans lesbians might um, complicate some of these, um, like both the uh, presumption that uh, queer women aren't um, uh, at risk of um, HIV, but also the assumption that trans, uh, that uh, queer women aren't um, engaging in recreational um, drug use, and I just wondered if trans lesbians how they how they fit into some of those assumptions. Do you want me to go first, Rachel? Sure, I just have a small uh, comment to that. Um, yeah, so I, I think you bring up a really interesting point. And um, I don't know if you've read um, Paul Preciado's Sex, Drugs and Biopolitics in the Pharmacopornographic Era, but um, that's, that's a book I kind of immediately thought of like with your, with your question. And I think it would make a really interesting dimension to um, bring in Preciado's um, specific use of drugs because um, in that book, right, they use testosterone, specifically black market testosterone um, as, um, as kind of as what they describe as like an illicit drug and using this black market testosterone to engage in that um, transition kind of outside of biomedical paradigms renders them like to quote them, a, a drug abuser under French law. So I think that would be a really interesting dimension to bring in for sure.
Yeah, thanks for your question. It's such an interesting um, and important topic. Um, and I did interview a few um, trans lesbians or queer women um, as well as part of my study. And I think what became really prominent, particularly when talking about risk, was that people, um, and I think particularly younger people, were starting to move away from these rigid ideas of gender and risk and what kind of certain bodies should look like under certain genders and starting to think about, okay, well, maybe gender isn't the question we should be asking. Maybe we should be asking questions about bodies and risk and what that means and how they become attached to particular identities as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's part of a conversation that's emerging um, in the HIV space, or at least the space that I was engaging in, and something that people are, yeah, just beginning to think about and, and think about how, um, how to manage. So, yeah, thank you. We have four minutes, uh, so <laughs> you have time to ask a question or to make a, a comment. Um, I've got another question again for Kate. Sorry, I'm not like talking. Yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. <laughs> um, I was just, um, so I'm just really, really interested. I'm really interested in your project and kind of like the results that will come out of it. And that's kind of relates to my question, like, um, uh, and I don't mean that in like an antagonistic PhD sense of like what's your PhD for which is what plenty of people ask me but it's <laughs> like what is there like a political objective because that seems to be and it may be part and parcel of sociological research it will be like repurposed in some way to or you'll be working maybe with community centers or groups or activism or something like that I'm just wondering is that something that you're aiming for with your research and kind of tagged onto that in terms of that re, um, the, the advertisement the kind of the hoarding that you talked about at the beginning did any of your did that participant is it Ellen did, did they talk about what they would have liked to have seen in terms of advertising or has anybody talked about what they would like to see in terms of like particular like affect theory like what are the kind of images that they would like emotionally relate to that might open things up a bit or at least feel more welcome in terms of asking for prep or asking for you know advice or dialogue about things Thank you for your question. Yeah, so important. And I don't mind the PhD, what are you going to do question at all. Um, yeah, much of my um, research, and I kind of work across media, I've done a little bit of photography work, lesbian magazine work, as well as this more sociological work. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. <laughs> um, so some of it, a lot of it just comes out of um, my um, horror at realising as a lesbian that other lesbians are not represented in HIV work or... Um, epidemiological categories. So some of it is just that kind of political work of making visible something that hasn't been visible before. Um, but there is particularly the sociological element, um, hopefully in talking about um, queer women's experiences of um, going to the doctor and trying to access tests and um, what happens if you have a partner who's living with HIV or if you're living with HIV um, in Australia, I'm hoping that that will, um, yeah, influence HIV organisations or at least start a conversation about, um, yeah, minority groups within minorities in the HIV space. Um, and with regard to your second question, I'm thinking particularly of one participant I had who um, is dating a, someone who, in a relationship with someone who is living with HIV. And she was just talking um, a lot about how there's very little information and very little um, just anything in the HIV sector in Australia that represents women, but particularly queer women, and just asking whether queer women either even exist living with HIV. So I think for most participants, it was just anything that was relevant or reflected their identities or their bodies or their practices. Um, since there's nothing, I think anything would be an improvement. <laughs> yeah. All right. I was thinking that when you were speaking also that perhaps uh, Rebecca, next year's conference can relate to COVID-19 and, and women's health and, uh, and, and medical humanities as well, because, you know, it's affecting the world and, and women in particular. Yeah. So um, I think I will try and dig it out for where after this call, we'll go to call the Zoom um, room A for like the final goodbye and what have you but I will try and find the link before then but I think at the IMLR that they, they are doing a series on COVID and women so okay. I will try and dig that out or I've, I swear I've seen something but I'll try and dig that out in time All for right. the next little mini zoom call All right. sounds good 
All right, friends, uh, it's 11.15 my time. <laughs> so I think we are uh, just uh, and it's 4.15, Rebecca, yes? All right, so our timing is perfect. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your critical thinking and your uh, very sharp and very important uh, reflection. So I would like to applaud all of you and uh, thank you for your participation. And thanks again to Rebecca and Ben who've done a marvelous job uh, for this conference.